All right, uh, any questions from last time? Remember that when I was like so gracious and I gave you guys a whole hour off early? It's the last time it'll ever happen in this class. Never again. Uh, it probably won't happen. However, let's continue talking about our toxicology stuff. You guys have all recently overdosed on what substance? Whoa. <laughs> Weird flex, but okay. I was going to say sugar, but you know, this is a safe space. <laughs> and also a recorded space. <laughs> Anywho. Uh, yeah, so everyone's probably consumed a bit of a stimulant today, at least maybe some caffeine. Um, and we kind of lump all these different stimulants under one category, and we call those the sympathomimetics, right? Why do we call it that? And mimic the symp uh, sympathetic nervous system. That makes good sense. And so you already know what that toxidrome is going to look like, right? And so how might you expect that to look? If you have a patient who's either uh, ingesting some amphetamines or they snorted some cocaine, or what, what would they look like? Sweating's one, right? So you're, you're diaphoretic. And to go along with that, they are tachycardic. tachycardic. But to go with the sweating, they're usually, what's their temperature? Usually hot. They're usually hyperthermic. So they're having tachycardia. What else cardiovascularly would you see? Hypertension. What CNS stuff could you see? Mydriasis, for sure. What else? They're going to be kind of sleepy, just kind of chilling up back in the bed, being very cooperative. Not so much, right? They could be very uh, agitated, very anxious. They could develop, could be very violent in some cases. They could develop seizures, all of the kind of bad stuff. But, um, and we can kind of divvy them up based off of more specifically kind of what uh, receptors are interacting with. You'll find some that are going to be kind of ubiquitous in, in, in interacting with both alpha and beta receptors. Some of them might be a little bit more specific. And so that toxidrome can shift a little bit in how that might look. So as an example, we have something like a beta agonist like theophylline or caffeine. Um, when you activate beta-2 receptors, what would you see, cardiovascularly speaking? Hypertension, hypotension. Beta 2, you'd think smooth muscle relaxation. So you'd expect to see hypotension, right? Because that smooth muscle is relaxing around the vessels just like it would around the lungs. And then how about beta 1 stimulation on the heart? Tachycardia, right? So if you had someone who had taken too much theophylline or had a, a super therapeutic concentration of theophylline, you'd end up seeing them being tachycardic, but they actually might be hypotensive. Right? So even though it's a sympathomimetic, they don't always, patients don't always have to be hypertensive in order for that to kind of fit the bill, right? So again, it goes back to what substances you think they might be, uh, have been exposed to. Caffeine, similarly, they'll fit into that methylxanthine sort of category, right? Um, albuterol is another one, clenbuterol. Anyone know what clenbuterol is? That's kind of an interesting one. Uh, if you know any bodybuilding um, uh, friends or anything like that, or if you're familiar with that community, um, you know, they're usually on a cycle. They bulk and they cut, and they bulk and they cut. Um, clenbuterol is a substance they can actually use to try to uh, get rid of body fat. And so um, there's been some interesting case reports of people making home made clenbuterol, and they actually had uh, very significant uh, electrolyte disturbances. What electrolyte disturbance would you expect to see from a beta 2 agonist? We talked about it in emergency medicine. What does it do to your potassium? Remember CA big K drop. Remember the A was albuterol, right? Beta 2 agonist causes potassium to go inward. So there's actually an interesting case report of these two bodybuilders uh, who were otherwise very healthy, but they came in very tachycardic, hypotensive, and their potassium was like two and a half or something like that, right? You know, it was very low compared to what it should have been because of the actual um, clenbuterol, right? So again, sometimes there's a little kind of idiosyncrasies with individual substances. You don't have to memorize all of those, but the main point is to know is kind of what, in, in general, does a sympathomimetic look like? And I think most of you have a pretty good idea what that looks like already. Uh, in some cases, you can have things like that are just pure alpha agonists that can cause very significant hypertension, things like your phenylpropanolamines. You ever see PPA? They used to be included in some uh, older uh, diet agents, right? Because, you know, using stimulants, you increase metabolism, you can lose body fat, things like that. Um, however, what's kind of the downside of those, do you think? Causing all that alpha constriction. Hypertension leading to heart attack, stroke, right? If you cause too much vasoconstriction, you're going to be impeding blood flow to those air, those organs, and the, the people have died from that before. Um, phenylephrine, we've talked about. Normally, you find that where? All right, so you see Sudafed PE, that is phenylephrine, right? That's going to be the stuff that you can get just on the normal shelves, right? Versus pseudoephedrine, which would be kind of more of a mixed acne sort of agonist, and you're going to find that's going to be behind the counters, right? Because what do you use pseudoephedrine to make? Meth? 
Meth what? Methamphetamine, right? So again, people call it meth, but it's good to kind of know the, the full terminology, so make sure you're kind of all speaking the same language there. But sure, amphetamines, methamphetamine specifically is what you can use Sudafed to make there. That's why they kind of crack down on that. Um, other things, LSD. Where do you find LSD? Not the back of my car. <laughs> Got rid of it, so we can get um, Or what is LSD? Lysergic acid diethylamide. What is it? It's a hallucinogen, right? You get, you know, it's kind of outside of your guys' time frame. If you go back to the 70s, right, LSD was really, really big back then. Um, but it's a hallucinogen that people would take in order to have these nice hallucinations and out-of-body experiences, but it acted a lot like a sympathomatic. Cocaine, obviously, is going to be a big one. Um, now, if you had to imagine, you know, looking at the split between cocaine and amphetamines, if you were to, say, go to, say, downtown Orlando or, say, downtown Jackson, what do you think you find more of? Amphetamines or more cocaine? Hmm? Well, so it's interesting. So I said downtown Jacksonville, right? Because you still think that actually it's a lot. If you go right downtown, right? So if you go to Shan's Hospital and you're right in the middle of downtown, it's a lot of crack cocaine, right? Because again, when you see these kind of more urban sort of populations, you're going to see a lot of crack cocaine. When you start to go out more to the rural areas, like most of Duval County, that's when you start to get into more clandestine meth manufacturing and things like that, right? So we see a lot of methamphetamines there. Um, so again, it depends on where you practice and what you're going to be seeing more of, right? And so you might see a little bit different flavors depending on kind of what the situation is. Um, anyway, so these are the common agents you're going to run into that are most likely to have a sympathomimetic sort of effect. So again, depending on where they're acting, you may get a little different flavor, as we kind of mentioned. Um, most of them are going to be working either by directly activating the receptors, right? So things like your PPA, phenylephrines. Some of them are going to be working to actually increase the release of your own endogenous catecholamines. So they kind of directly stimulate release of things like norepi and epinephrine. This is where things like cocaine and amphetamines come into play. Now, kind of in that whole catecholamine category, we have norepi, epinephrine. What's the, the third one that fits in that category? Hmm? I think you said it. Dopamine. dopamine, right? Dopamine's really important in that, right? And why do we care about dopamine in terms of these agents? That makes them addictive, right? Because that's part of that reward pathway. This is why these substances tend to be so addictive, specifically the cocaine and amphetamines, because of the fact that you're increasing release of dopamine that stimulates that pleasure center and says, oh, wow, that was really good. Let me try some more of that and some more of that and some more of that. And that's how they end up getting addicted in those cases there. Other things you can do, like blocking reuptake, or inhibiting the metabolism, we've covered those before. We're talking about depression medications, your MAOIs, your uh, SSRIs, et cetera, right? So what you expect to see, so based off strictly just the alpha stimulation, you expect to see mydriasis, you expect to see hypertension due to that arterial vasoconstriction, you see diaphoresis, and actually in some cases you can see some platelet aggregation being activated. Why would that be a problem here? So you get a clot and you're constricting all those blood vessels, guess what? You're going to find inclusions much more easy, uh, more uh, likely to happen than if you had just either one by itself, right? So again, this is why you worry about people getting, uh, they frequently come with cocaine chest pain, right? One of the big things to rule out is make sure they're not having an actual <coughs> MI, which is just the vasoconstriction, or sometimes some of that, out, that uh, platelet aggregation is kind of playing a role there as well, right? Due to the beta-1 stimulation, you should expect to see increased inotropy and chronotropy, so tachycardia is expected there, cardiac output should be up. And then based off the beta-2 stimulation, that's where you're going to see that smooth muscle relaxation. Sure, they might be breathing very well, because that all the bronchial smooth muscles relax, but also you're going to expect to see, in some cases, that hypokalemia. You can see some vasodilation. Sometimes that can balance out with the alpha stimulation, but more often than not, they're going to be hypertensive. But again, if you had strictly just a beta-2 agonist, like that clenbuterol I mentioned, that's where you can see that uh, vasodilation. Sometimes hypotension can be developed there. So, um, and just to give you some examples of what this kind of look like, you know, so if it's just strictly beta 2, it's tachycardia, hypotension. If it's alpha, you may see actually they're hypertensive with maybe a normal, say, to decrease heart rate. Versus if it's mixed, you may see kind of all of the above, right? So it really depends on how they look when they're coming in. Um, so, again, look at the vital signs. See, those are consistent with asympathomimetic, um, but just know they can come in a little different flavors there. You're going to be correlating this with some of the other signs and symptoms they're going to have to, again, key you into saying, okay, I think this is this type of substance that I'm dealing with. So looking at your differential, as we mentioned, the anticholinergics look very similar to the sympathomimetics. Now, what do you think might be some differences between the two? Hmm? They're not dry. Yeah, so if you have a sympathomimetic, you would expect them to be diaphoretic. You expect them to have moist mucous membranes versus there's an anticholinergic, so it would be pretty dry, right? They have urinary retention. Um, I can tell you those anticholinergic 
intoxicated patients may be so hyperthermic that they tend to sweat anyway. Sometimes you have some overrides there, so you can't totally hang your hat on that, but that is one thing to consider uh, between the two. Is it one, anticholinergic, typically more dry, so the bathomimetics is a little bit more moist, right? Um, no way to describe your patients as moist, but again, that's kind of how you think about it. Um, what other things would you differentiate between the two? What kind of listen to on the patient? So both probably going to be tachycardic. They're both probably going to be a little hypertensive. What else could I listen to with my stethoscope? Hmm? Okay, so how the lungs maybe. So, yeah, so lungs should sound similar, right? Because, again, they should expect to be nice and dry and open up. But the bowel sounds, how are the bowel sounds going to differ? They should be diminished. To absent with an anticholinergic because we know they're slowing down the GI tract. Remember that delayed absorption we talked about, how sometimes you may have drug that's just sitting there in the stomach waiting to be absorbed until the gut start to wake up, and then that's how that kind of re-sick, re-sickening that happens there. Um, versus something like a sympathomimetic, what might you expect to hear? Probably increased bowel sounds, right? If anything, you may see some diarrhea associated with that, some abdominal cramping. So again, listen to the bowel sounds, and that can give you a clue as to what you may be dealing with, okay? Um, sympathomimetic versus anticholinergic, right? Uh, some other things to look at, you know, serotonin syndrome, neuroleptic malignant syndrome, uh, malignant hyperthermia, all these things can look very similar to one another, and it's important to try to rule things out so you can say, okay, well, what's my definitive treatment going to be here? So, for instance, if I had someone who's having neuroleptic malignant syndrome based off the history, what would be the agent I'd give them for that? <coughs> you know, lead pipe rigidity, and they were taking some Haldol, history of schizophrenia, what do you do for that? You can use dantrin, right, potentially to help with the, the muscle relaxation, so they don't, that way they don't get rabbed though. What else could you use though? Remember, like Haldol said, anti dopaminergic agent, so I give them something that activates dopamine receptors, bromocryptine, right? Remember? So again, based off the differential, based on what you kind of rule it out as being, okay, well, I think this is NMS versus I think it's serotonin syndrome, the treatment's going to differ there, and that's why it's really important to try to delineate. Some of this is based off history, based off the medication records and things like that to try to determine what, kind of what you're dealing with in those cases there, right? Withdrawal syndromes, especially from um, depressants like alcohol or benzodiazepines or opioids, tend to look a lot like some pathomimetics as well. So again, it's important to get that history, if you can, to determine kind of what you're dealing with. So again, looking at this uh, comparison between the two, it's very difficult to determine which one you're dealing with if you have a patient who may be lying to you or they're altered enough that I can't give you a history. Um, the nice thing, though, is we're going to see in a second, the treatment's going to be pretty similar for the most part between the two in, in just a moment here. But again, they're both going to be showing up mid They're both going to be showing up hyperthermic, et cetera. Um, so really, the bowel sounds are going to be a big thing to determine between the difference between the two and then also kind of what their, their fluid status is. Are they holding onto a bunch of urine? Are they really dry, plenty of dry mouth? That's going to be speaking more to the anti allergics, right? Okay, so what do we do for these patients? Obviously, ABC is going to be the first thing. Typically, um, airway and breathing are not going to be a big problem for these patients. Circulation, obviously, they're going to be also having pretty tachycardic hypertensive, so that's usually not the big issue. Um, but looking at the GID contamination, right? So a lot of this is going to depend on the route of administration. So how much you administer, or a patient may administer, a sympathomimetic to themselves? Hmm? So you could swallow it, right? So again, if you were to take a bunch of Adderall or something, that would be swallowing, right? So you have oral ingestion. We'll talk about oral decontamination in a bit. What else? Hmm? You can injectable. All right, so again, is there any decontamination you can do for an injectable? Not usually. Once it's in the system, it's in the system. You can't do much for it. What else? Yeah, snoring, right? What's the, what's the fancy term? Yeah, insufflation, right? It's not what you get for dessert at a fancy French restaurant, but it's insufflation of, of uh, things like cocaine and whatnot. So could I do anything for that? They come in, they got a bunch of powder left on their nose. Of course, you have to rule out maybe it could have been a powder donut exposure. I see some of you probably have a little bit, a little bit of that going on. But let's say it's cocaine. What could you do? Hmm? Yeah, so you could try to, you want to decontaminate, right? So again, you could use something like a saline. But actually, that will end up solubilizing and will actually absorb some extra cocaine. So I'll actually kind of thank you for that. So, wow, it's almost better. Um, however, you can do is something like, you know, you can take Vaseline on a Q-tip and just go ahead and just kind of wipe that out there. You're using a more fat-soluble substance is going to be good to try to get rid of that, okay? So think about the route of exposure. Think about they're having continued exposure and get rid of that, right? So, again, they got a bunch of cocaine sitting there in the nares. So like, get rid of that first, and that's going to help you to eliminate further exposure, okay? So little things to think about. Um, also, you think about, you know, things... Like being in Florida, especially if you're working down, say, like in Miami Dade, and let's say you were worried about people who are maybe transporting medications or substances across international borders there. Um, you guys familiar with body packers and body stuffers? What are the difference between those two? Stuffers, 
you're, you're getting there. <laughs> so the way I think about it is Packers are going to be people who are uh, from Green Bay. I'm just um, <laughs> Packers are people who are going on a trip, right? So typically what you find is that these are people who are muling substances across borders. They typically have a lot, a lot of drugs in their system, but they're typically very well wrapped, right? Because again, that's product, that's money basically they're transporting. And so they want to make sure those don't get absorbed by the, the patient, so to speak, right? And so that's where you end up finding people who are, um, you know, coming into airports or ports of entry, and they may have a lot of drug in their system there. Usually they're actually ingested orally. Um, they may find like either like condom wrappers or they're like kind of wax, um, wrapped in wax or things like that. Typically there's a lot of drug there, but it's usually well wrapped, so you don't have to worry about exposure in a lot of cases. However, sometimes they do burst, right? That's going to be a problem if they have a big sympathomimetic exposure right there in the GI tract. Yeah, because what happens when all those blood vessels start to constrict from like cocaine? You know, it gets very ischemic and gets necrotic and it's going to die out. So that's actually a, an emergent sort of surgical um, uh, referral right there. Um, however, we'll talk about GI decontamination, how to get rid of that. Body stuffers, on the other hand, are people that see their red and blue lights. Maybe they're selling stuff on the streets and they get very worried and so they wrap it up real quickly and then what do they do? Try to get rid of it, right? So that stuff typically is not going to be as well wrapped. You're much more likely to see that it's low volume, but you're going to have more likely that it's going to come out and potentially get absorbed. Uh, right. So again, those are the big differences between those two. But again, think about, okay, well, is there any drug left in the system? Is there any stuff that might still be there? So I'll give you an example. Um, one of the, the toxicologists I used to work with worked down in Miami-Dade, and so they went to the airport, and they would actually have a whole stall where they would have people they suspected of being a mule. They would do an x-ray. You think you could see anything on the x-ray? You could. You could actually see, if you did a KUB, you could actually see a little of the drug packets that were in there. And they would use, go lightly, basically, to try to clean out the entire GI tract. We'll talk about whole bowel irrigation in a second. Um, and so they would actually have clear tubes coming off the commodes that they actually see the, the stuff coming through. They'd have a filter where they can um, capture it all up, and that's their evidence, essentially, right? Um, and again, most of the time, those people, they actually knew how many they had ingested because, again, if you ingest 50 packets of cocaine, how much did you show up with at the, the drop-off point? You probably should have 50 packets at the end of the day, right? So they know exactly how much is there because oftentimes their family's at risk, you know, if they get caught or things like that. Um, and so this is one of those things where if they say, okay, well, I know I passed 49, I got one more left in there, sometimes they maybe get access to it and actually try to swallow it again, because that way if they go to jail, guess what? They have some drugs, they have some, uh, you know, a bit of a bargaining chip. So again, little things to think about um, as far as um, potential exposure you can see with these uh, drugs there. Some of you are like, oh my gosh, like that stuff happens. <laughs> yeah, it happens, yeah. Um, anyway, so what can I do for these patients, right? So again, um, we'll talk about uh, as far as decontamination goes a little bit more in detail in a second. Um, but one, you want to try to cool them down if you can, put them in a nice calm environment. Some of these patients are going to be pretty belligerent in some cases there, so that can be tough. Sometimes you may need restraints. Oftentimes you may need chemical restraints. I say chemical restraints, what am I referring to? So uh, benzodiazepines, and so I've heard someone say Haldol, and so it's actually probably going to be one of the things you might want to avoid. However, if you see a patient who shows up demented and they're dangerous and being a threat to the staff and themselves, oftentimes they're going to get a dose of Haldol anyway, but that can actually kind of cloud your picture a little bit. Really, benzodiazepines are going to be your best friend there, right? You just want to chill them out, give them some Ativan, some Versed, any of those are going to be totally fine to try to calm them down. Other things include like propofol is another good one if you really need to, if you had to intubate the patient, you know, so any kind of set that's going to be useful here. Um, but remember, they may require cooling. Especially some of these like designer amphetamines, things like um, like when bath salts were kind of a big deal a couple of years ago. Um, a lot of them patients, uh, those patients got very very hyperthermic, like in the 106s, 107 degree Fahrenheit. Um, they're basically cooking their their brains, right? So we had to make sure we were cooling them down either by putting them into an ice tub, right, uh, or using some kind of ev evaporative cooling or IV, yeah, cool IV fluids, things like that. All really important. Um, get them cooled down. Uh, and then looking at the benzodiazepines, those are useful for helping with the hypertension. You're going to be useful with agitation, seizures, et cetera. All going to be good there. And then if you need to, give them something to help out with the blood pressure, heart rate. Normally, benzos are going to help out with this uh, pretty significant amount. But if you need to, add on additional vasodilators potentially. So things like nitroprusside, things like esmolol. Esmolol is what to class a drug. It's a beta blocker, right? So again, you want to be careful, and again, this is one of those kind of medical dogma things you'll probably hear, is like you never want to give someone who has cocaine intoxication a beta blocker. Anyone ever heard of that? Why is that? Well, they talk about this unopposed alpha constriction, right? Because remember, the beta 2 effects, what did that cause? To blood vessels. It caused vasodilation, right? So they're kind of balancing out between the alpha effects and the beta 2 effects. If I were to give a beta blocker and take away that beta 2 effect, guess what would happen? 
severe vasoconstriction, you were about to be stroking out, having a heart attack, et cetera. Um, and so that has come in the common wisdom there. So sometimes if you ever have to give a beta blocker or try to get the heart rate down, they would oftentimes give a dilator, vasodilator along with it. Something like a nitroglycerin, nitroprusside, a calcium channel blocker, any of those are fine. Um, again, most people are uh, going to be fine just with benzodiazepines, but also think about if you need to get the heart rate down, blood pressure down, we have agents to do that. Okay. Right, so moving on, next we have the opioid talk. Oh, yes, sir. Typically, you'd want to give a vasodilator with it, right? Now, does it mean if you give a beta blocker to your patient, they're going to have a stroke immediately? Probably not, right? You don't want to be the one person to do that, and all of a sudden you have a case report, and you have the, something named after you for something you did to kill somebody. You don't want to be that person, right? Um, so typically, you're going to see that you'll give the two together, right? And But I could give something like a non dihydropyridine calcium channel blocker. That would actually kind of perform both actions together, right? Because I would be able to get the heart rate down with, like, verapamil and the blood pressure down together, right? So again, think about your agents. Think about what's going to be uh, most beneficial for what the patient's kind of presenting, what their initial problem is, right? However, if I have someone, say, who presented with, say, theophylline overdose, and they were tachycardic and hypotensive, well, I can give a beta blocker in that case, and I don't have to worry about necessarily the blood pressure um, spiking up, right? Because, again, the drug's not doing that. It's not causing the alpha constriction in those cases, okay? So that'd be really more in the cases like in amphetamines or cocaine that's causing more nonspecific activation of basically all the adrenergic receptors. Uh, and, again, we'll talk about some more cases and stuff going forward and talk about ways to manage those things. Anyway, so what's an opioid toxidrome look like? You had to guess. So you talk about pinpoint pupils, so you talk about meiosis happening there. What else? Shallow breathing, right? Bradypnea, hypopnea, right? What else? Hmm? Yeah, it's just the absent bowel sounds, absolutely, right? Because again, we know opioids are going to slow down the GI tract, right? And the mental status is typically. Oh, you guys are right now, very depressed, right? <laughs> Typically, you're going to be a little bit sleepy. You guys are supposed to be all energized from the donut sugar, but since the insulin is now starting to spike up a little bit, so it's okay, we'll, we'll work through it. Um, anyway, so again, just know that when we're talking about opioids, really this is uh, kind of referring to any sort of non-natural substances that have the same actions there, so that's where we lump in things like tramadol, buprenorphine, fentanyl, et cetera. Um, buprenorphine is being a, a big one we're seeing nowadays, because what do we normally use buprenorphine for? People have opioid substance abuse issues, right? People are trying to kick the habit of opioid abuse and trying to wean themselves off of it. That's where you see a lot of buprenorphine. However, those patients, where they oftentimes do, well, they relapse, right? Because again, a lot of times people are going to fail at those things. We see a lot of exposures to buprenorphine from that, that case there. Anyway, but again, we already have a pretty good idea what that toxidrome is going to look like. And again, remember, we have three different main opioid receptors. The mu receptor is the main thing we're really focused on here, right? Because again, that's responsible for the respiratory, the CNS depression, and also the meiosis we can see with that. And I will tell you, um, just because a patient does not show up with meiosis, does that mean you can rule out opioid intoxication? No, right? However, if they show up and they're respiratory depressed, seen as depressed, I can still keep that in my difference, right? Just because they don't have the, the meiosis does not mean anything. Because sometimes you can actually find some agents will actually cause my dryasis, right? Uh, if you think about tramadol, if you think about um, some possible uses for tramadol, where do we say it was good uh, in terms of therapeutic uses? Hmm? For sleep? Plus trazodone, right? Tramadol, right? yeah, for what type of pain? Hmm? You could do for ortho pain, but what else did it, did it do? It had some mixed actions, if you remember. Anti Not so much anti inflammatory. It had some uh, uh, reuptake inhibition of norepinephrine, which, which is good for what type of pain? Neuropathic pain, right? So sometimes tramadol gets used for that neuropathic pain, but if you think about it, if I'm blocking the reuptake of norepinephrine, I've increased norepinephrine levels, what does that do to my pupils? of my dry just like we saw the the sympathomimetics, right? So again, it's one of those things where if you see it, great. If not, you can't rule out a good intoxication um, just because of that. Anyway, but again, the mu receptors are the main ones you're focused on. As I mentioned, there's lots of different routes of exposure. People will sometimes snort uh, their products there, especially like the long-acting agents like OxyContin. Now, a lot of times you'll actually find the manufacturers are putting them in uh, abuse deterrent sort of formulations. So, for instance, if I try to crush an OxyContin nowadays, it forms this kind of big gummy mass that I'm not able to easily get the drug out of. So, again, there's ways to try to get around that. I'm um, also thinking about things like fentanyl patches. Now, remember any uh, big counseling points as for, in terms of safety we talked about with like fentanyl patches? Hmm? Don't apply what to it? Heat, right? Why don't you want to apply heat? 
increases absorption, dispersion of the drug, right? And again, what a lot of people use in conjunction with a good non-pharmacological way of handling pain? Heat, right? So again, this is one of those things where you may have inadvertent exposures to opioids or inadvertent overdoses just based off of patients not knowing things or maybe doing things inappropriately. So if they apply heat there, they put a fentanyl patch on, they go, oh, let me go hop in the jacuzzi because it really helps out my back. And all of a sudden, they're absorbing a lot more fentanyl than what they're expecting to, et cetera. And of course, think about the time to effect. It can be determined based off the route of exposure, right? So if you had to guess, what do you think is the fastest route of exposure for any of these substances here? Hmm? Ivy's pretty quick. There's actually one that's a little bit faster than that. Snorting is actually a little bit faster, right? And uh, that makes sense based off if you think about where the actual, actually, I'm sorry, not snorting. Uh, I meant to say uh, inhaling, right? So again, if you actually were to inhale these medications, uh, that's a much shorter route to the brain than if you were to inject it intravenously, right? So usually inha inhalation is going to have the fastest onset. You'll find that um, IV is going to be a little bit slower than that, and then followed by insufflation typically. And then what's kind of the slowest? Oral, right? Because again, you have to think about the drug getting uh, dispersed in the GI tract, getting absorbed, and all that kind of good stuff. So it's a lot slower. And again, think about that in terms of how how fast uh, the onset is going to be there. That's a big thing. We talked about medical marijuana and talking about edibles, right? What do we talk about there in terms of education? A very slow onset of oral ingested, orally ingested THC versus things you smoke, right? And what did people tend to do when they, re they didn't realize they had a slow onset? Started dose stacking, right? So again, these are things to, to educate people and let them know, hey, it's going to take a little bit longer to kick in than maybe what you're used to if you're using an edible product versus something that's going to be inhaled. Anyway, um, and then again, based on the duration of action, is going to be determined by the drug itself, right? So morphine's fairly short acting, has a half life maybe one and a half to three hours versus methadone, very long half life, 15, 30 hours. So you can expect patients to be sedated for a very long period of time, depending on what they might have been exposed to. Not only that, but again, we said it does what to the GI tract? slows it down, right? So that means you can have a whole bunch of drugs sitting there in the stomach waiting to be absorbed until the GI tract starts to wake up again, okay? So I mentioned um, you're going to see meiosis commonly, but not super, super common. I can probably say I've probably seen more cases without the meiosis than I have with the meiosis. Um, but certainly you're going to see CNS depression, all the analgesia with it, that euphoria is seen with that. Um, respiratory depression is a big thing. Sometimes, especially if they've been respiratory depressed and they maybe have been um, passed out for a long period of time, they can have volume actually pooling within the lungs. You can see pulmonary edema happen there occasionally. Um, cardiovascularly speaking, you're not going to find a lot, maybe some relative bradycardia hypotension, but not nearly to the same degree as what you would see with, um, say, like a antihypertensive agent or something like that. And we mentioned the, the decreased bowel motility. And then typically temperature, if anything, maybe a little hypothermic, but not really um, too many changes there as well. Okay. Again, think about the mixed actions of some of these agents here. So for instance, if I have something like tramadol and I'm blocking the reuptake of norepinephrine, that overstimulation of the CNS could lead to what? Seizures, right? So I can have someone who is, looks basically comatose from the tramadol they ingested, but then they develop a seizure. And a lot of it could be related back to the norepinephrine effects. So you have to think about this kind of mixed pictures here. Um, things like, you know, uh, meperidine or dextromethorphan. Now dextromethorphan, where do we talk about that? What is dextromethorphan? Yeah, it's robitussin. Yeah, right, it's dextromethorphan. It's actually a, a derivative of uh, opioids, which makes sense because what's another use for opioids? That's an antitussive. Yeah, we can actually use an antitussive. So it makes sense that dextromethorphan is a derivative of that and is used specifically for cough suppression. However, we don't get the same opioid effects. But it does block serotonin reuptake. So again, serotonin syndrome could be a risk with that or something like meperidine or tramadol. So again, you may see kind of a mixed picture here depending on what other medications might be on, on the patient's profile. Um, and then things like partial agonists. How might a partial agonist actually present? I know I told, I told you guys a story before about a patient who had overdosed on buprenorphine and they presented with a sort of atypical picture. You guys don't remember all my stories? It's very upsetting. It's okay. I, I, people forget my jokes or my stories because I, I tell it all over again. But basically, EMS was calling in and they said, hey, you got this lady who overdosed on buprenorphine. She's coming in, right? So me thinking of what I'm expecting to see, right? Because, again, you want to have an idea of, okay, I'm expecting to see this coming in. This is what I'm going to do for it. You already have a plan in mind. I expect to see this person coming looking like what? CNS, respiratory depressed, right? Not really moving around a whole lot. Maybe needing to be intubated. That's what I'm expecting to see when I hear an opioid overdose. However, this lady came in. How do you think she presented? It looked like withdrawal, right? She was actually going crazy. She was trying to fight off the staff. She was screaming. It was like, this is not, this looks more like someone took a bunch of, uh, you know, PCP or ketamine or something like that. This does not look typical, right? However, once we were able to calm her down, we were a little out of van, we got the story out of her, and actually what she normally takes is methadone, 
a full agonist. She had taken a partial agonist, buprenorphine, and guess what she did? Threw herself into withdrawals, right? So again, think about these kind of atypical presentations, how it still makes sense, but you got to get the history to, in order to make some sense out of that, right? So again, and, and very frequently, whenever you have a patient you uh, suspect to have some sort of drug exposure, your knee jerk reaction is going to be to order what? You're in drug screen, right? At least you'll learn that. Most people are just going to do it anyway, right? Um, you have to know what specifically is being tested for when you're in drug screen because I will tell you there's a lot of false positives and there's a lot of false negatives. And very frequently, I have people who will order a urine drug screen. The patient is respiratory, CNS depressed, and it could be an opioid, but the urine drug screen comes back and it's negative for opioids. So they say, okay, well, it's not an opioid. However, when you give them the reversal agent, guess what? They wake right up. So it's important to know what's going to show up and what doesn't show up on your test there. Um, some of the uh, tests are very basic and they only test for a very uh, limited number of things. So synthetic agents like, you know, fentanyl, tramadol won't show up on there versus things like heroin will absolutely show up, right? Because a lot of it's based off the assay and what it will cross-react with. Now, uh, just to give an example, at my hospital, where I did my fellowship at, um, oxycodone was very scattershot whether or not it would trip the assay. And again, being in Florida, what do you think we saw a ton of? all this pill mill shut down. A lot of oxys and a lot of hydrocodone, right? We saw a lot of prescription-based drug products. The heroin was not a big deal here until we started to shut down a lot of those pill mills. And so what you end up finding is that even those patients would have a negative urine drug screen, they were still definitely being exposed to those opioids, right? That's still the main cause of their clinical picture. Um, you know, keep in mind things are going to be false positives as well. You know, if I take a bunch of Sudafed because I have a cold and you did a urine drug screen on me, anyone know what I would show up as? It showed up as amphetamines, right? So you say, like, okay, well, you must be doing a bunch of math. And I was like, no, I just had stuff he knows, right? Um, so again, it's good to know what's going to be a false positive, what's a false negative, et cetera. And just because something comes back negative on a urine drug screen does not mean you can hang your hat on that, right? You still got to do some more detective work. You still got to still give uh, a history. You got to give some provocative tests. Don't rest your hat on just on the urine drug screen. Anyway, um, actually, less often, more often than not, the urine drug screen is completely useless. And I always tell providers, don't order it. You don't need it. Guess what they do anyway? is to order it, and that's going to be useless for us. Anyways, um, how do you manage someone with uh, opioid overdose? It's going to be the biggest concern out of the ABCs. The airway breathing is the biggest thing, right? Again, so you got to make sure they're going to be able to protect their airway, make sure they actually have enough respiratory drive, otherwise you need to start breathing for them, okay? Oftentimes, these patients end up getting intubated, or potentially if we can give them a reversal agent, we can try to wake up that respiratory drive, just that. Um, GID contamination is going to be very dependent on the substance that was ingested. We'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, and our antidote, what is our antidote? Naloxone, or brand name? Narcan, right? Absolutely. So again, this is not naltrexone. Naltrexone is an oral product that you're starting to see for certain um, abuse disorders. You might see it used for weight loss occasionally. This is naloxone, right? This is the IV product that we're using here. Then it's a competitive antagonist. So it's going to kick that opioid off the receptor and reverse those effects. Now, again, what are some caveats we talked about with naloxone? You do have to worry about them going into withdrawal, okay? Assuming the patient is chronically on opioids. Now, if I have like a little kid who gets into grandma's morphine and I give them Narcan, are they going to withdraw? No, because they're opioid naive. They've never been exposed to it, all right? It's a very safe drug but you need to know to be careful in those patients who are chronically exposed to opioids. What's the other downfall of Narcan? Very short acting, right? 20, 30 minutes or so, the drug effects are going to be gone. That means you need to consider either putting them on a drip or you need to make sure you have the doses available to redose them as needed. And again, that becomes very important when you have something like methadone. So if I have someone who overdoses on methadone has a very long half-life, sometimes they're going to be on a Narcan drip for two or three days, right? before the drug is finally out of the system there. It just depends on the situation, right? Heroin's a lot shorter acting. Oftentimes, they don't even need the, uh, the, the um, uh, naloxone drip. It just depends on the clinical situation, right? Anyway, um, and again, depending on kind of where you're working at, I'll tell you an example. Um, you know, the dose of naloxone can actually change pretty drastically. So for instance, um, something like heroin, which is very close to the original poppy plant, like it's very sensitive to naloxone. It's very easy to kick heroin off the receptors there versus synthetic products like fentanyl, Tramadol, oxycodone, what we saw a lot more down here, um, was much more resistant to it. I had to give much bigger doses. So to give you an example, if you worked up in New York several years ago, where heroin was more predominant, you'd be giving micrograms of naloxone to the patients, just enough to kind of wake them up a little bit, right? Just enough to get them starting to breathe. Do I want them awake? Probably not. Probably because they paid a lot of money for the heroin, and now you're rever reversing those effects. They usually are not very happy about that. So you just want the breathing. Versus down here, we were having to get milligrams and milligrams of naloxone, sometimes up to 10 milligrams, just to see if they would even respond. Okay. And again, if someone wakes up after giving naloxone, that's a much better um, determination of what they've been exposed to than any urine drug screen is ever going to do. Okay. Again, how fast is the onset of naloxone? 
almost immediate, right? So it's a very, if you give it too big of a dose, it looks like the exorcist, right? So you're gonna wake up very suddenly. Oftentimes our GI tract is gonna wake up and guess what happens? Vomiting, diarrhea, very common to see with that, right? So again, be careful with your doses, otherwise you can make your nurses very mad at you and you don't wanna do that, right? So as I mentioned, again, I'm not gonna ask you specific dosing here, but just know that synthetic opioids require bigger doses because it's harder to kick them off the receptor. They just bind more tightly there. Um, and sometimes we do have to put them on a naloxone drip. Again, that is helpful because that means we don't have to set up the bedside and keep giving doses over and over again when they resedate. We can go ahead and just um, put them on a drip and titrate to effect, right? And typically, you just want them to be able to be rousable to, you know, loud voice, right? I don't need them to be actively awake, but if I call their name, they should be able to at least have some response to that, right? And again, what are monitoring um, parameters going to use uh, to determine if they're breathing adequately? O2 sac can be useful, right? What else can I look at? Maybe this is a little bit more sensitive. CO2, right? So if you can do entitled CO2, that is also very helpful. Because um, again, O2 sat is kind of a peripheral reading. It's going to, it has, it's kind of slow to catch up on those things, especially if the patient really gets hypoxic, like it's, you're kind of behind the eight ball in that respect. Um, but if I can monitor entitled CO2, that's much more responsive to that. That Because um, again, you can have someone who has a relatively normal respiratory rate, but if they have very shallow breathing, uh, they're not really oxygenating that well, and that CO2 will start to climb. And that could be a sign that I need to give more naloxone, right? Okay, uh, I'll actually have our sedative hypnotics. And so, again, as I mentioned, my lectures do not fall into this category strictly, but you can consider it certainly a sedative. Um, but a lot of things fall into this category here, like our benzodiazepines, our, all of our barbiturates. Now, again, what's the most common barbiturate you're probably going to run into with your patients? Maybe phenobarb, maybe in dogs. You have seizure disorders. We don't use a ton of phenobarb anymore, though, because it's like really sedating. Maybe in kids who have like uh, difficult to treat seizure disorders, but more commonly, what do you run into? Butalbital. It's an actual barbiturate. Now, again, it doesn't fit that naming convention like phenobarb or pentobarb, so it doesn't necessarily ring right to mind that it's a barbiturate. But if you have patients with migraines, and they're on fioracet or fioranol, that has a barbiturate in it, and that can be sedating. And again, very frequently, if I have a patient who shows up with a urine drug screen that has a positive barbiturate, again, I don't assume that they're actually abusing phenobarb because it's so uncommon you see that. But I ask them, hey, do you have migraines? But yeah, so what do you take for it? I take fewer set. Okay, well, that explains it, right? That explains why you, they have a positive barbiturate screen. Anyway, other things, muscle relaxants are a big, big one here we see. Because, um, again, patients will go to a pain specialist. They complain of pain. They usually get prescribed opioids. They get prescribed a muscle relaxant. They get prescribed a benzone. But those three combinations are very, very sedating. Because, again, they tend to be synergistic. So it's not uncommon to see someone who's abusing oxycodone, alprazolam, and then cyclobenzaprine all together, or carisoprodol. That's a very common combination. Um, your baclofens, carisoprodol, cyclobenzaprine, all of those fit in that category. Now, which receptor do those work on? Muscle relaxants. GABA B, right? So, again, it's a little bit different than you'd see with the uh, benzos and the bars, which are working more on GABA A, right? Um, then, kind of miscellaneous agents. Obviously, a very, very common co ingestion with many of these different substances is going to be alcohol. So, you do want to monitor levels for that, right? So, again, if you have someone who comes in seeing us depressed, Go ahead and try to rule out alcohol exposure and get an alcohol level, and that can tell you. And what the legal limit is? Hmm? Yeah, you got a blood level. 0 0.08 or 80 milligrams per deciliter is another. So again, depending on how they're reporting it out, uh, it differs there. Um, but again, you'll have patients who come in 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.4. Sometimes that's just their level. That's just where they live at, right? And usually they're like a 0.15. Somewhere around there. But again, that could be normal. You remember, tolerance is a big deal. So, again, what do you worry about with these patients? Their levels start to drop down. Withdrawal, right? So, again, just keep in mind you have these chronic alcoholics, like they need that alcohol around just to maintain normalcy. When they start to get below that, you worry about the withdrawal, right? You guys don't even know what's in here. <laughs> anyway, um, chlorohydrates is not something you're going to run into frequently anymore. It's actually been removed off the market, but it was a good sedative agent we used in the NICU. Anyone familiar with GHB? It's like kind of notorious for. The date rape drug, right? So again, it's a very powerful sedative, but it's very short acting. And so patients would basically be knocked out, whatever nefarious acts were performed upon the person, and they would basically wake back up, right? Um, and so that's a, another one you may uh, see used occasionally. I have not ever run into it, at least uh, something that was that apparent, but certainly alcohol is going to be pretty ubiquitous amongst a lot of these exposures. Anyway, as I mentioned, most of them are working at GABA-A. They're all increasing that chloride conductance to hyperpolarize that cell, which is why you see that sedated sort of picture there, right? So I should expect to see decreased mental status. Now again, do I expect to see a lot of respiratory depression? It depends, right? Um, some of the more powerful ones like the barbiturates absolutely are going to see respiratory depression, right? What about like propofol? 
cause respiratory depression. It was a notable celebrity who met their demise of propofol. Michael Jackson, right? Again, this is a very powerful sedative, and again, it can knock the respiratory drive. Now, I'll tell you, benzos by themselves typically don't have a big effect on respiratory drive, especially oral ingestion. They're very safe in that regard. However, if I start to mix it with alcohol, if I start to mix it with muscle relaxant, if I start to mix it with opioid, guess what? Absolutely. So you do want to worry about respiratory depression. You want to monitor for that with these patients here. Um, cardiovascular speaking, you may see a little bit of hypotension. You may see a little bit of decreased GI motility, but not to the same degree as opioids for sure. Um, and just know that some of them may actually have some anticholinergic properties as well. So they can kind of come with a mixed picture. Because again, anticholinergics can frequently present with what kind of mental status? And they get a little sleepy, right? Talk about lower doses, see kind of seen as depression versus the higher doses we see that excitation. Um, so especially like cyclobenzaprine, carisoprodol can have a little bit of anticholinergic sort of effects there. So again, sometimes it's a little bit agent dependent, but for the most part, this is kind of what they look like presenting. So again, airway management is going to be the biggest thing for these patients here. Now, in terms of blood pressure, if I need to get the patient's blood pressure back up, what do I do? Hypotensive. Fluids, what am I going to use? Are you going to use isotonic? Fluids, crystalloids, normal saline is probably going to be your, your bread and butter from that uh, respect. Um, and if that's not working, what can I use? You use epi? You can use epi potentially. What else? Vasopressin. Yeah, again, you want to think about vasopressin being used if you have really leaky capillaries, right? So you think about like really inflamed sort of conditions like sepsis. That's where that's going to be uh, more appropriate there. But just strict vasopressin. What else can I use? Dopamine is a good option. What else? Dobutamine, not really, because that's going to help out with the heart rate, right? Because that's a beta-1 agonist, but it doesn't do much for blood pressure. It's another catecholamine. Norepi, right. absolutely. So norepi is probably the one that we recommend far and away. Because, again, if you think about it here, if the patients are just hypotensive, or we're not necessarily depressing the heart, so uh, so to speak, um, we can give it a more preferential alpha agonist like norepi, and that helps us out from that regard. So most of the time, from a tox standpoint, we'll make sure we recommend norepi first line for most cases there. Uh, as far as antidotes go... Clomazinil can be used to reverse benzodiazepines. However, what's the big risk with that? Withdrawal, right? So, again, if, someone, if it's a little kid, they get into someone's Xanax. I'm not too worried about that. However, it's a patient who's been exposed to it chronically. If I would take that benzo effect away, what happens? Withdrawal seizures, and they can die from that, right? So, again, that's where you really worry about that. This will not work on barbiturates. It will not work for alcohol. It does not work for anything. Is there any way to increase elimination of alcohol or reverse the effects of alcohol? Hmm? Like throwing a cold shower, drink some coffee, no, nothing, right? That's all, all things are time in, in those respects there. So for a lot of these, you just had to give them time. So if you have to intubate them to breathe for them, allow for the drug to wear off, and then that's what you got to do. Yes, sir. Dr. Wood, I dismissed what you said about norepi. Norepi is used to wake up with side patients. It's good for blood pressure management, right? So again, if they come in, they're hypotensive. Very frequently, we will recommend norepinephrine because it helps to get that uh, a little bit more preferential alpha squeeze and the alpha constriction. And it doesn't uh, have a strong effects on the heart like something like an epinephrine would, right? Because most of the time these patients are just hypotensive because of arterial vasodilation, not necessarily from um, anything to do with the heart specifically, right? So you mentioned withdrawal. Again, um, usually these are going to be the opposite effects of what the actual drug exposure would look like. So an opioid or a sedative hypnotic withdrawal is going to look like very uh, excited. They're going to be very anxious. Um, usually GI hyperactivity diarrhea, vomiting, et cetera, um, tachycardia, hypertension. And again, that looks a lot like sympathomimetic, so it's important to kind of get the clue as far as what could be withdrawal versus what's actual drug exposure. Um, and again, just be very careful with sedative hypnotics when reversing those or having withdrawal from those because you can't see those withdrawal seizures. That can happen with alcohol, can happen with barbiturates. Anytime you're used to having that GABA effect around, the increased GABA effect, that becomes a new normal for those patients. If you remove that, you see too much glutamate activity, too much excitation, and seizures can happen, right? Now, what do you think like a withdrawal from, say, like an amphetamine would look like? Lethargy, kind of run down. You know, so again, it's not as severe as you see something like an opioid withdrawal. Um, but again, it's typically going to be the opposite effect of what you would expect the actual drug exposure to look like. Right? Okay, so some other things in terms of patient assessment we're going to be looking at. Um, again, think about things that cause typical cases of bradycardia. If a patient shows up bradycardia, what are some things that cause that, right? Well, commonly you think of. Beta blockers, right? Off the top of your head, you can think of beta blockers. We know it's going to slow down heart rate by blocking beta-1 receptors. Other things to think about, though, remember the cholinergics, right? If I had an organophosphate exposure, 
that blocks the acetylcholinesterase is going to cause bradycardia, right? Think about things like clonidine, right? The central sympatholytics. Guanfacine falls in that category too, right? You see bradycardia. non dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers, digoxin, right? These are things, again, you always want to come up with a differential. Okay, what could be causing this bradycardia, right? As far as tachycardia goes, a lot of other things could be causing this, right? Things like sympathomimetics, cocaine, amphetamines, et cetera, anticholinergics, um, antihistamines are common ones, neuroleptics. I say neuroleptics, what am I refer to? Yeah, antipsychotic agents, right? So all your phenothiazines, all your atypical and typical antipsychotics fall in that category, right? Um, Silicates can do this as well. So if you have like an aspirin overdose, they can frequently get tachycardic. Uh, iron's another one you can see that. Iron's kind of interesting. You can have a whole lecture just on iron specifically. Um, but basically, iron causes a, a very um, significant uh, vasodilation, causes hypotension. And so again, what does the heart do to compensate for the hypotension? speeds up, right? So again, very frequently you may find that patients are getting tachycardic because of the vasodilation they're trying to compensate for, not just because the drug itself is causing that tachycardia, okay? Patient shows up hypotensive, right? Think antihypertensives in a lot of cases here. Um, think about TCAs as well, right? So like an amitriptyline overdose can cause alpha blockades that causes hypotension, right? Um, think hypertension, you want to think a lot of your stimulants, sympathomatics, anticholinergics. Why do you think nicotine would cause hypertension? remember, what does nicotine activate? Nicotinic receptors, right? Remember, what are the, the mnemonic we use for the nicotinic effects? Days of the week. What was Thursday? Thursday was hypertension, right? So again, typically you're going to see hypertension associated with that. So if you had like a little kid who got into, say, an e-cigarette refill container, they drank all of that, they may show up extremely hypertensive because of that uh, increased effect there from the nicotinic activation. Caffeine's another big one as well, right? Most people are probably a little hypertensive right now just from all the caffeine we're ingesting, right? Most likely. Anyway, uh, patients are hypothermic or some things that cause this. Oftentimes, this is going to be more related to patients who have been down for a prolonged period of time. So, for instance, if you have carbon monoxide, uh, where do you think we get a lot of carbon monoxide exposures here in Florida? Generators, right? Why, why generators? Okay, during hurricane season, but why do they, why do they cause a carbon monoxide exposure? People leave them in the garage, right? Because again, generators are expensive. People tend to steal them. And so people want to run them in their garage. And guess what? It's a gas generator, just like a car would be running in the garage. And so it produces a lot of carbon monoxide and then get into the house and cause patients to um, become very CNS depressed. They pass out and then they're down for a prolonged period of time. And that's where the hypothermia usually develops there. Um, same thing as far as the opioids, hypoglycemics, et cetera, usually from being down for a prolonged period of time. Hyperthermia, on the other hand, can be oftentimes caused directly by the drugs themselves. And so common things include like uh, anticholinergics, sympathomimetics, salicylates, um, phenothiazines, antidepressants. Those all fit in with the either serotonin syndrome or the anticholinergic sort of properties there. Yeah, even thyroid preparations, right? Or thyroid preparations cause that. Well, think about personal hyperthyroidism, right? What is their temperature usually running? Usually run a little hot, right? Because again, there are increased metabolic sort of demand there, and that's due to the thyroid preparation. Now, again, if I had someone who overdosed on Synthroid, that's something I expect to see real quick. Why not? <laughs> Synthroid is T4, it has to be converted over to T3, right? So frequently, if I had a patient call up and say, oh, my kid excellent got into the Synthroid, what do I have to worry about? Often, what we'll do is we'll schedule a follow-up, and we'll talk to them in a week if it's a big enough dose we think it might be concerning. We'll call them up in a week, because that's usually how long it takes for a lot of that T4 to convert over, right? So again, think about the time frame of some of these preparations and when they might be presenting with symptoms, okay? Uh, bradypnea, so again, kind of the slowed breathing can be seen with things like clonidine. Obviously, your opioids and cytohypnotics are the most common. Tachypnea, Right, so things that are going to be increasing your rate of breathing. Uh, big one's going to be salicylates, right? So very frequently, if you have someone who's been exposed to too much aspirin, they will become tachypnic, and that's one of the big things we notice there. That usually induces what sort of acid-base disorder? So I'm breathing faster. I'm blowing off CO2. Yeah, respiratory alkalosis, right? So again, that's typically what you'll end up seeing with those patients there. How about cyanide? Anyone know why cyanide would cause tachypnea? Cyanide is really interesting uh, in terms of the fact that it actually prevents your cells from utilizing oxygen and basically block off the uh, the um, 
the electron transport chain to produce ATP. So your, your body switches over to anaerobic metabolism. So your body is kind of starving for oxygen, even though you're presenting plenty of it to the cells, you just can't use it. And so oftentimes they get to kidney as kind of a response to that. Um, irritant gases, when I say irritant gases, what does that refer to? It's not like after your neighbor has like next Chipotle for lunch or something. <laughs> Mustard gas falls in that category, things like chlorine gas. Anyone ever um, been cleaning at home and they mix bleach with ammonia on accident? It's not good, right? It produces chloramine gas, right? And that is an irritant, right? It gets in those mucous membranes and directly causes irritation. Guess what you do in response to that? So you're to breathe faster, right? Um, I had one patient called up uh, at the poison center. I'd never even, like, it's never crossed my mind until the guy actually mentioned the situation. As soon as he said it, like, it made sense. Um, he was like, oh, yeah, you know, my, uh, my girlfriend, you know, she's sick right now, so I was trying to help her out, and so I'm going to clean the litter box. So he used a bunch of bleach to clean the litter box. And guess what? There's a lot of ammonia in there from all the cat pee. So the bleach mixed with the ammonia all of a sudden makes chloramine gas. And he's like, I was coughing and hacking and had to get to, get out, leave the apartment because the whole place is uh, basically getting fumigated at that point. And so, oh yeah, that totally makes sense. There's a lot of ammonia and cat pee. Uh, ammonia and RP too, right? So again, it's one of those things that to consider there. So irritant gas is another big reason why people may develop tachypnea. Yeah. Uh, looking at things like meiosis, typically you want to think about things like um, your cholinergics causing this, uh, clonidine, opioids. Oftentimes, clonidine can actually present a lot like an opioid exposure, so it's not uncommon for them to actually accidentally get naloxone uh, because of that. My dry so typically going to be more sympathomimetics, anticholinergics. So again, a lot of this makes sense if you know the mechanisms of the drugs and how they're working and what kind of physical effects you'd expect to see from that, right? I promise we're going to break soon. I just want to finish up the section here. Um, diaphoresis, you'd expect to see some pathomimetics, obviously, because it causes hyperthermia. You're going to sweat to try to get some of that heat off. Um, why are organophosphates? Why does that cause diaphoresis? Because remember, they block acetylcholinesterase. And they cause a cholinergic toxidrome. And part of the cholinergic toxidrome is what? Sweating, right? So you expect to see secretions everywhere. Sweating is one of those things you can see with that, right? Uh, Salicylates can do this because they're causing uh, a hyperthermia there. Um, now, bullet, where do you think you would develop those? This is usually going to be from patients who are passed out on the, on, usually like on a hard surface for a prolonged period of time. They'll get kind of those pressure um, points where they'll develop the kind of uh, fluid filled vesicles. And so that's um, sometimes seen with like barbiturates, sometimes seen with carbon monoxide. They're not specific for that, but they've been kind of associated with those. Um, dry mucous membranes, obviously, anticholinergics are a common thing there. Can help us to distinguish between a sympathomimetic versus an anticholinergic. And then obviously, flush skin tends to be more with like anticholinergics. Um, carbon monoxide can cause this as well. And actually, um, anyone familiar with boric acid? Where do you see that at? Yeah, you can use it, uh, borax. It's, a, it's, a clean. it's not used as commonly anymore. Sometimes, it, you guys ever made uh, slime in like elementary school? You got Elmer's glue mixed with boric acid. That uh, actually makes a little, you can go do it at home now if you, if you feel so inclined. But um, what used to happen, used to be used to, clean, like, um, used to clean baby bottles and things like that back in the day. And so uh, moms would forget to clean it out, put the milk into it, the kid would drink it. All of a sudden, get this kind of flushed lobster Red lobster looking sort of uh, appearance there. So, again, some of these things can have very kind of um, characteristic uh, presentations to them. That's one of the ones for boric acid. You get very flushed. And then uh, let's go ahead and do a 10 minute break now. We'll come back and talk about seizures in just a moment. Uh, any questions before we go? All right, come back in 10 minutes. <laughs> any questions from the first half? Anything at all? All right, uh, so moving on. Next, we're going to talk about seizure inducing agents. So, if a patient presents with a new onset seizure, you don't know the history of it, oftentimes drug exposure can be one of the big causes for that, right? So, obviously, you want to rule out the other obvious stuff like hypoxia, hypoglycemia, et cetera. Um, but then you got to look at uh, drugs that can induce seizure here. And, and one of the things you'll learn about toxicologists is we love our mnemonics. We've already helped you, I've already helped you with a few of those so far. Um, another one we like, and just to show you just how wide ranging the number of substances are that can cause seizures. We have one called Otis Campbell. Now again, the long one, and so most people usually don't reference back straight back to this, but I use it as an example to show you of all the myriad substances that can cause seizures here, right? And again, a lot of these make sense based off of the mechanisms, right? So you can already kind of guess which ones of these can lead to seizures. So for example, just off the top of your head, can you think of anything, any examples of things that can cause seizures? Things we've already talked about potentially. Alcohol withdrawal, fantastic. That's a very good one. What else? Benzo withdrawal, fantastic. What else? 
about you're out at a party, see some strange white powder in line formation, cocaine, right? I'd be a very bad drug dealer, I think, because if someone come up and ask him for a cocaine, I'd say, is Pepsi okay? <laughs> Probably get shot, but... Um, <laughs> cocaine, so going along with cocaine, what else could you see? In that sympathomimetic bill. About amphetamines, right? Someone takes too much Adderall, they can develop seizures, right? Uh, you have someone who is taking too much uh, pseudoephedrine, that can cause seizures, right? A lot of things can cause seizures here. And again, a lot of it's based off the, the mechanisms, okay? Uh, how about methyl xanthine? We're talking about caffeine and theophan. Remember, those actually antagonize adenosine. Where adenosine normally sh stops things, right? It can stop the heart. Normally, it stops seizures in the brain. If you antagonize that, guess what you can see? See seizures, you can see dysrhythmias. Um, so again, there's a lot of things here that fit into this category. Other things you may uh, consider as well include a lot of like antidepressants fit into this category, especially things like TCAs, uh, like your amitriptylines and whatnot can do this. Think about things like lithium. A lot of your behavioral meds can lead to seizures in, in some cases there. Um, lidocaine we've talked about is causing CNS uh, disturbances as well. How does that normally manifest early? Uh, yeah, metallic taste in the mouth, kind of tingling lips, things like that. Those are things we consider, especially if you have like um, the one thing we run into very frequently is if we're using like epidural uh, infusions of things like bupivacaine or other local anesthetics. Oftentimes we'll we'll use that as a guide to say, okay, well if they're getting any, you know, numbness of the, the lips or uh, metallic taste, that's usually something they're getting too much drug, but that can lead to seizures in some cases. So a lot of different things here. Um, what do you think insulin could cause seizures? Hypoglycemia, right? So again, going into any of your hypoglycemic medications like sulfonylureas can certainly lead to seizures in those cases as well. So you can go back to the mechanism. A lot of it will make sense when you actually get down to it. Now, certain odors can actually lead you to suspect certain um, intoxications. Now, most of the time, our patients, when they're coming in, um, they usually don't smell great. Uh, and so oftentimes, other odors can kind of overpower a lot of these. So I can tell you probably... I can probably tell you zero times that I've actually made a diagnosis based off just the smell of the patient. Um, however, these are things that are commonly linked, and you may actually see this on your boards occasionally, right? They're like, what smells like bitter almonds? And you would say? Cyanide, cyanide right? You suspect cyanide. Now, again, how often am I actually running into that? Not very frequently. Actually, some people don't even have the genes, the genetics, to smell bitter almonds. It's just something some of you guys don't have. Is what it is. Um, but these are the things we char characteristically think about this, right? Um, now, if you smell like mothballs, does anyone actually ever smell mothballs before? They don't seem to do frequently. Pretty, pretty characteristic odor, but those are things we think about, like camphor, um, which are made in, in mothballs. That's another thing that can cause seizures there. Um, things like uh, wintergreen are usually methyl salicylate, right? And that can cause what kind of toxicity? Basically, aspirin toxicity, right? So if you ever have someone that gets in, like a little kid that gets into oil of wintergreen, that's a high, high amount of salicylates so that can lead to some pretty severe toxicity there. Um, another thing to consider those rotten eggs. Anytime you smell rotten eggs, you should be thinking sulfur. And so hydrogen sulfide is, is a big one you can see with that. That's usually um, a big warning sign to stay away from an area. There's been some cases where patients have uh, tried to commit suicide um, by producing hydrogen sulfide because it's a very quick, um, uh, it can incapacitate people very quickly. However, if other you know providers get uh, exposed to it, they can become patients at that point as well. And so again, it's one of those big warning signs. You smell rotten eggs, not a great thing. Uh, one of the medications we'll talk about a little bit, an antidote actually smells a lot like rotten eggs as well. We talked about it before in terms of uh, as a mucolytic. Anyone know what that is? Is that N-acetylcysteine? We'll talk about that in terms of uh, acetaminophen toxicity, but that's one sometimes you'll see used as a mucolytic and uh, for respiratory purposes. And that's another one uh, that has a very uh, high sulfur content. It smells a lot like rotten eggs. Um, now this is, a, this is actually a really good one. You do want to know. I uh, do want to be aware of, and this is going to be things that cause a wide anion gap acidosis. Now, how do you measure your anion gap? Yeah, so you take your positives and you subtract your negatives out. So you take sodium minus your bicarb minus your chloride. And I'll give an anion gap. Anyone know what's normal? It's like 12 plus or minus 4. And so I usually say anything above 16 I consider to be abnormal um, in terms of um, a wide anion gap acidosis. Usually the bicarb is going to be low, or you may see that the chloride is... Um, uh, is also low there to widen out that gap. That could be signs of, of an acidosis. And so you do want to know um, what uh, are common causes of widening and get uh, metabolic acidosis. And if you guys heard of the mud piles before, it's a good mnemonic to remember. This, I expanded out a little bit, so I do cat mud piles um, because there's several other substances. I don't make up the mnemonics, right? I just relay them to you, right? 
Um, anyway, so we have the cat blood piles, and it includes a few other toxins uh, that can commonly cause a wide anion gap acidosis you want to be aware of, right? And again, a lot of these are things that are easy to rule out in, in order to say, okay, well, I know it's not this. Let me look for other causes for why the patient might be acidotic, okay? Um, so first off, it's going to be methanol. Methanol is, is what? What do you use it for? Windshield washer fluid, right? So again, it, uh, it's good because it doesn't freeze very easily. It has a very, uh, very low freezing point, so because of that, we can keep it in our uh, windshield washer reservoirs and use to wash our windshields even in cold climates, right? Um, again, this is a toxic alcohol. It gets turned into a lot of really nasty acids that can lead to a wide anion gap acidosis, right? Now, again, look at the history. If your patient presents coming from the nursing home and they have a wide anion gap acidosis, it doesn't seem like it's likely to be methanol, then you rule that out, right? You say, okay, well, it's probably not that, right? Versus if it's someone who's depressed and a relatively young patient, they come in with this and they had a big bottle of windshield washer fluid next to them out on the scene, and then you probably have a good idea that's what it is, okay? So again, little things like this in the history, you want to rule things in or out. Uh, uremia, where would you see that typically? Renal failure, right? And again, where would you determine if they have uremia or not? With the B1 and creatinine, right? B1 specifically will tell you if they're uremic. If that's lower, then you know that's not going to be the case there. Okay. Next is DKA. Now again, why do they get acidotic? Mm -hmm. Yeah, because again, they can't use carbohydrates for energy, so they're switching over to using things like breaking down um, uh, muscle, but also the free fatty acids that produce those ketone bodies and those other acids. So they develop a wide anion gap acidosis, right? Okay. And how could you check to see if a patient was in DKA or not? You look for ketones, right? You look for acetone. What else? What if their blood sugar is 100, 120? Probably not DK, right? Versus if it was three or 400. Then you can say, okay, well, maybe it's DK. Maybe we can maybe see if that's what's going on. Um, Peraldehyde, anyone know where peraldehyde you're going to run into? I don't either. Like, I've never actually seen it. I don't know where like, you're going to run into it. Uh, however, we keep it because it keeps the mnemonic, right? So, again, we will remember it specifically because it helps produce a mnemonic. So, don't think too much about that, because um, mud aisles doesn't make as much sense. <laughs> Up next, we have isoniazid. Where do you see isoniazid? Do you have patients who are treated for TB? That would be a common thing. Um, iron is another one who might be a potential patient uh, exposed to iron. Hmm? Anemic patient, perhaps, yeah. They're taking iron anyway as, as a supplement for their anemia. Well, who else? Hmm? Say it. Maybe hemochromatose, uh, not the same kind of iron toxicity we're talking about. I'm talking about taking like a whole bunch of iron, developing toxicity from that. We think pregnant women actually is a, is a one, or potentially kids who are around pregnant women because you get a lot of iron in prenatal vitamins. And again, some people get very distressed about the fact that they are pregnant, and so that could lead to some issues there, right? Um, or again, not even pregnant women, but people who may become pregnant who are taking prenatal vitamins, okay? You don't have to be pregnant in order to take prenatal vitamins, obviously. I had one case where a um, uh, boyfriend and girlfriend were getting into an argument. The girlfriend's very upset, so she takes a whole bunch of prenatal vitamins uh, and actually develops very severe iron toxicity from that. So it's kind of a common thing you, you run into. It's kind of a common case for it. But little kids can get into it just as easily. Um, lactic acidosis, what are some causes for this? A lot of things. So sepsis is a big one, hyperperfusion of the organs, hypoxia, a lot of reasons you develop lactic acidosis. You see this with um, rhabdomyolysis. You can see this, all kinds of different things. So again, uh, how would you determine if they have a lactic acidosis? Check a lactic acid level, right? That'll tell you specifically, is it lactic acid or is it something else causing this acidosis? Good. Um, next to ethylene glycol, what is this used for? It's antifreeze, right? It's found in radiator fluid. This is, it goes in the same category as methanol in terms of toxic alcohols. Now, again, who do you think might be exposed to this? Little kids, potentially? Does anyone know what this stuff tastes like? Sweet. Very sweet. And you know what it's colored like? Yeah. Looks like Gatorade. Do you know where some people tend to store their radiator fluid? Gatorade containers. I can tell you, at least on... It's one of those things, like, when I got into... You, like, you hear the stories about people doing that. Like, there's obviously no one dumb enough to actually do that. <laughs> there are people who are actually dumb enough to do that. And guess who gets into it? <laughs> Little kids, right? So, again, they suffer based off people mislabeling containers or putting things into other containers. It's not good. Always keep stuff in the original containers if you can. And so, again, it's very sweet. And so, who else might actually get into it? Maybe non person related. Pets, yeah, that's why if you ever see a uh, pet friendly radiator fluid, it's actually uh, another um, acid is, or another alcohol is called uh, propylene glycol. It's usually based off that. It doesn't taste very good, it's uh, very bitter. And so, it keeps animals and hopefully kids out of it. Um, but again, if you see a fluorescent, uh, blue or green liquid in a container, in a Gatorade container, and you drink it in a sweet, kids are probably going to drink all of it, and then there you go. You have a very, very toxic kid who will develop an acidosis based off the byproducts of 
the, as, uh, the actual alcohol there. And then sulcelates is going to be the S in the mud piles, right? So again, sulcelate toxicity um, is going to be a big one. Um, we can see uh, either oil of wintergreen or most often it's going to be just aspirin ingestions. Okay, so that's the mud piles, right? So again, how do you rule out uh, aspirin toxicity? Get sulcelate level, right? So again, easy drug level you can always get. Tylenol, salicylates, always, you can check those out. Easy to roll out some of this stuff, okay? So salicylates, if the level is negative, then you know that's not the cause for your acidosis. Okay, up next, and then you have the CAT. So this includes things like cyanide and carbon monoxide. Now, again, most common causes you're going to run into cyanide or carbon monoxide toxicity is what? House fires, right? When you start to burn up um, artificial fabrics and things like that, that produces cyanide, right? Combustion of... Uh, products like wood and other things produces carbon monoxide. It's a very common reason why people will be exposed to this stuff. Again, oftentimes that's why firefighters and paramedics will carry things that can actually help to treat things like cyanide toxicity. Um, but those are big ones. So other things for carbon monoxide is what, as I mentioned? Generators. Uh, what else? Cars left on in the uh, garage. What else? I had one patient who um, got toxic. Actually, the whole family got toxic. Um, where the, uh, I believe the dad had recently split up with the wife. Uh, and so he had three little girls at home and he was trying to cook for them. And so he said, I'm going to fire up the grill. It's raining outside though. So he backed the grill right up into the door of the house. So he's trying to grill out, watch the little girls run around being heathens, right? He wants to keep an eye on them, wants to cook up some food. And guess what? All that carbon monoxide got blown into the house and they all end up getting toxic, right? So again, little things like that. It's usually combustion of materials where you see a lot of carbon monoxide. Um, Alcoholic ketoacidosis, who do you think might develop this? Alcoholics, right? So chronic alcoholics tend to see that. And then toluene. Anyone already see toluene? It's paint thinners, right? I mean, who, who would ever be exposed to paint thinners? I had this one patient. Actually, this is a very interesting case. I'll never forget this guy um, because we saw him probably a dozen times in the ER. Um, but he presented based off of um, hip pain. That was his initial complaint. Um, and so he got sent to the fast track of the ER. Normally, us as toxicologists would hang on the more critical care sections where our patients used to end up. Um, but we had this uh, one of the residents come over uh, from the fast track and say, hey, got this guy. Um, you know, he was complaining of hip pain. He's kind of squirrely, but we went ahead and got an x-ray on him. Uh, and sure enough, he has a hip fracture. The history was he got, he's walking out of the Walmart parking lot and got nailed by a shopping cart. So went ahead and checked it. He has a hip fracture. We're going to admit him. So I went ahead and just got a basic set of labs. And sure enough, what do you think he had? wide anti-gap acidosis. So we said, well, what the heck's causing this, right? So again, it's just an incidental finding. A uh, guy otherwise wasn't symptomatic just besides being just super squirrely. Apparently that's just how he, how he presents, right? He just had a very strange sort of affect. Um, and so we started to go through it and we finally got a history from the patient. Again, he was very hard to communicate with. It was not very uh, uh, eloquent, I would say. Um, but he kept saying, tall weenie, tall weenie. And we're just like, what the heck's he talking about? What had happened was, was that he was in the Walmart huffing tall weenie because that was where he had access to. He goes in the back of the hardware section. No one's going to bother him, right? I don't know if you know, but the uh, people who work at Walmart are typically not the most uh, uh, diligent at their jobs. Uh, if I've ever tried to find anything there, they've been less than useless. But <laughs> as it depends on which Walmart I go to. I don't want to denigrate fine workers. But um, anyway, so he was abusing that. He was huffing this toluene and developing this acidosis. So obviously he was a little altered from the toluene, causes kind of an intoxication. Walking out of the Walmart, didn't see the shopping cart heading right for him, got hit, broke his, uh, got hit with the cart, broke his hip, and then there you go. So again, sometimes you have very atypical presentations for this stuff that doesn't really fit the bill, and that's how we determine that. Again, the guy had been using so much toluene, though, by the time we saw him for the fifth or sixth time, because that was just his toxin du jour, um, they eventually got a uh, CT scan on him. And I mean, basically looked like moths have been eating at the brain. He's just losing bits of material based off this kind of chronic exposure to the stuff. It's not good, but again, something can cause a wide anti-gap acidosis. And again, it makes the mnemonics of cat mud piles. These are things you want to rule out if possible. So again, if I had a patient coming from a house fire, some of this differential should kind of pop up on your list. Okay, well, they have an acidosis there coming from a house fire. Guess what? Check for carbon monoxide, check for cyanide. These are things you want to look for, right? Okay, um, other things to consider, radio-opaque agents, right? So what are some things that can pop up on a KUV that can help you determine your diagnosis? And so we use uh, the mnemonic called CHIPES here um, to help us out and to determine what are some things that may present on a KUV. Now, again, don't, am I, as a toxicologist, often recommending getting a KUV? 
not typically, it's usually kind of an incidental sort of finding. They'll get a KUV, maybe a patient's complaining of abdominal pain, they'll check it and all of a sudden, oh look, there's a bunch of iron in here. Well, no wonder they're having abdominal pain, right? Um, so these are things that will show up. Typically heavy metals will definitely show up on these things. So if you have someone who ingests iron, uh, lead, anything like that will show up because it's radio opaque on the x-ray. Um, anyone remember another, um, say someone's having gastroenteritis, another metal they might be ingesting that will show up. Pepto-bismol, right? Because what's the metal there? Bismuth, right? So the bismuth will actually show up and it has a kind of a punctate kind of look to it. Anyway, that's one thing. Iron, as I mentioned, uh, is there. Chlorhydrate, it's not a drug you're going to see very, very frequently. It's kind of old wing, but again, we keep it for the mnemonic's sake. Um, phenothiazines occasionally will show up. This is a lot of your typical antipsychotics, like your haldols and things like that, occasionally. And then enteric coated products. These are things that are meant to pass through the GI, uh, through the stomach without being broken down. So think about enteric coated aspirin, right? They're kind of um, uh, meant to protect themselves from that gastric acid. They will sometimes show up. And then finally, um, salts, like potassium salts and things like that will also show up. Because potassium is just what? It's a metal, right? So again, anything like metal base will, uh, again, show up on those things, right? And so here you can see... Um, Pills, uh, kind of, they're located in the stomach. Again, um, it's good to know sometimes to say, okay, well, at least we have confirmation of exposure. Sometimes it's useful. Sometimes it's good to see kind of where things might be at in the GI tract. And obviously here, this looks like it's probably pretty early on in the ingestion, right? Probably hasn't really passed uh, the stomach yet versus, um, you know, things you might see kind of more diffusely throughout the GI tract, right? Again, now, if I had someone who had uh, an iron ingestion uh, and I could not see anything on the KUB, do I rule out that ingestion? No, right? Sometimes things don't show up. And so, again, it's nice if you see it, but never rely on, on a KUV for a confirmation of exposure. Okay. okay. So, again, those are common things, common things to rule out, things you can think about uh, in terms of patient assessment. So, again, I could ask on a test question. I could say, hey, patient presents, um, you know, hypotensive, bradycardic, which of the following agents is most likely to present with this toxidrome? And you should be able to pick it out based on the substance, what could be most likely responsible for that, right? So again, these are things I want you to, to think about. Switching subjects, going to decontamination. There's a lot of different types of decontamination, and depending on the exposure, we'll determine what kind you need. So we can talk about dermal decontamination, ocular, and uh, the lion's share of it will be focused on the gastrointestinal decontamination. So dermal decontamination is really important, um, and if you ever get to participate in a mass casualty event, we usually do those uh, around like the March time frame in, in most hospitals, at least here in Orange County. Um, and so uh, you get to practice doing these things, right, because it's a, it's a skill to develop. Um, because, again, if you have, say, uh, some sort of uh, chemical spill, say, on, on 417, a tanker flows over and releases chlorine everywhere, or if you were to have something at the airport or something like that happen, basically all those patients... Um, who are coded in a substance could be potentially getting it exposed to other healthcare workers, right? And then you have more patients. So it's really important to make sure you decontaminate these patients before they get into the actual hospital setting, right? Um, anything to, to know though is again, you want to make sure you're removing any kind of contaminated clothing, anything that might be exposed, because if it's in, in the clothing, guess what? It's still on the skin, it can still cause further exposure. Um, typically, if you can use a lot of water, it's going to be good for most substances, but soap and water is going to be good to get off some of those things that are a little bit more um, a sort of basic or things that are going to be a little bit more fatty. It's going to help get rid of that stuff, right? Sometimes diluted bleach solutions are also used. It'll have the same effect as soap and water, essentially. Um, the other big thing to think about as well, though, is going to be things like skin folds, right? So even if you have a gaseous sort of exposure, say you're exposed to some kind of chlorine or chloramine-containing uh, gas, what you can find is that uh, patients who have uh, so you know, skin folds, sometimes the gas will kind of uh, get between the folds. It'll kind of uh, get... Um, you know, revert back to a more liquid form, uh, and that will then have exposure there. So you want to make sure you clean out everything very, very thoroughly. Otherwise, you can have further people, either they're getting further exposed or other people can get exposed. And in fact, if you're doing these mass casualty events, they'll make put marks on the patients in random spots, and that way when they get in, one of the things they're looking for is if they still have those marks on them. If they don't, then they got decontaminated properly. If they do have them, then they shows that they need to go back and get re, re decontaminated. Anyway, um, in terms of ocular decontamination, what can we do? Obviously, time is tissue in these cases here. I'll never forget one of the uh, very kind of one I always think about in terms of ocular exposures was, um, again, this is in Duval County, so again, we've already kind of alluded to the kind of individuals we're dealing with there, but uh, it was more in the rural outskirts of Duval County, and we had two kids who were playing with what other toy than an empty Drano bottle. They're tossing it back and forth on a grand old time until the top came off, and you guys splash some of the Drano right into the eye. So obviously, very, very caustic substance, uh, very, very painful for the patient there. But again, time is tissue. So we had to make sure we got that decontaminated as soon as possible. Otherwise, it's just going to keep eating away that tissue, potentially leading to coronal abrasions and blindness, et cetera. So what can you do? One, they have contact lenses. 
take those out, right? Because again, that could be another further reservoir for exposure, so take that out. And then uh, if you can, use a Morgan's lens. So if you've ever seen one of these, basically you can hook it up to an IV uh, solution or IV uh, saline solution, uh, place it right in the eye, kind of like a contact lens. Um, usually you're gonna be applying a, an anesthetic like tetracaine or something to the eye first to numb it up, and that way you can run uh, saline directly over the eye and it'll just kind of wash everything away, okay? Um, if not, what could I do if I didn't have a Morgan's lens? Yeah, so you can actually use a nasal cane to put it over the bridge of the nose, and they'll have kind of the same effect there. Morgan's lenses are nice, but uh, if you don't have access to it, it is what it is. Um, make sure you're checking the pH. So you want to go back, and again, you can use the uh, pH paper just like you can use for anything else. Um, just dab it in, into the conjunctiva and see what the pH is. Make sure you go back 15, 20 minutes later to make sure that it hasn't re-alkalized. Frequently, we have to make sure we're... we're uh, you're getting for at least 15, 30 minutes, if not more, especially in the case of a base like sodium hydroxide. Okay, GI decontamination. We have several different options here. I'll tell you which ones we actually use and which ones we're not using so much anymore. Ipecac, someone familiar with the famous Family Guy scene? If not, go watch it. It's very, very funny. Basically, they all ingest Ipecac to see who can hold on to their contents the longest, and they get to win a pie or whatever it was at the time. So anyway, so basically what Ipecac does, it used to be in kind of an old school of medic, uh, medication that we would use to induce vomiting. The goal was if you ingested something toxic, you would induce vomiting to try to puke it up, and then you're good to go. No, no further exposure there. How effective was this, do you think? Not very. They actually found even if you did it right after exposure, maybe only got 30% of that content back. Very difficult to get rid of all of it. So because of that, what is the other risk of vomiting? Well, you can aspirate, right? And once you get the stomach acid, aspirate into the lungs, guess what? It's going to cause irritation. It's going to cause a pneumonitis. Very frequently, the substance they ingested was much less toxic than whatever they're going to get down into the lungs now. So because of that, we didn't really recommend it. Also, it's interesting, uh, or why, the reason why we kind of came out against it was that, in fact, uh, people would abuse Ipecac. Who might abuse Ipecac? Bulimia patients, right? Because it would induce vomiting, get the weight down, and so you'd find that uh, chronic exposure to Ipecac actually cause uh, cardiomyopathy. So you'd have these young individuals who are very skinny, but have these big, huge hearts because of cardiomyopathy from the Ipecac. So because of that and the ineffectiveness, we said just go and stay away from it. Now, nowadays, you see Ipecac is probably going to be in, in a homeopathic product where it's been diluted to where there's probably not even a single molecule of Ipecac left in there, but is what it is, right? the essence of, of Ipecac, you may see. But um, I have a bottle left over, I think, from the 80s. It's when it expired, and so it's part of my tox memorabilia, but you cannot find it anywhere else. I've not tried it, though. That would, couldn't pay me enough. Um, another uh, thing you may see, and again, Ipecac's never used. Gastric lavage may be used occasionally, right? And so it's important to know um, what is uh, potentially going to be uh, amenable to gastric lavage and what's not going to be. So you want to know the contraindications as well here. Basically, what this is going to be used, um, and the time frame is really important here as well. This is going to be used within one hour of the ingestion. Why one hour, do you think? What happens after the hour? Past the stomach, now you're unlikely to get much stuff back. But basically what you're going to do is be instilling either tap water or normal saline into the patient's stomach, and you're going to draw it back out. And you're going to repeat that several times when you're trying to get whatever drug product's there. Now, what you're going to find is that the basically we're putting a small garden hose down the patient, right? It's usually a very large um, tube that has uh, holes in the side of it. One thing you have to consider is how big is the substance you're trying to take out. If it is plant matter or if it's a very large tablet or something, it's not going to be able to fit through the holes and you're unlikely to get anything back. Okay. So again, how frequently do you think we do this? Not very, right? Uh, most people don't even know where the lavage kit is in, in the ER, and so it takes too much time to set up. Most people are past the hour anyway. Um, and again, oftentimes what you're going to find is you end up drawing up a lot of mucosa along with that because the tube will get stuck to the side of the stomach and then it's, it's no good. So we don't really like to use lavage too, too frequently. However, it could be used potentially for life-threatening ingestions for stuff that can actually fit through the holes within an hour. So asper uh, contraindications here, these are important to know. Um, if they're an aspiration risk, so if they're so seen as suppressed and not protecting their airway, we do worry about that. And so in those cases there, um, we will not do lavage. Now, if they're already intubated, we're kind of protecting the airway for them. So that's less of a risk. Um, any sort of corrosives or hydrocarbon ingestions? Why hydrocarbons? Why are, the, why are those bad? That's going to, again, be the aspiration risk, right? Hydrocarbons in the lungs are going to tear up that surfactant. It's not good, right? So you're going to end up finding, a, develop ARDS from that. Uh, so it's not any good. How about corrosives? Why is that bad? Well, if it burns on the way down, it's going to burn on the way back up, right? And again, that can also cause uh, respiratory tract irritation as well. So we don't want to do that. Um, foreign body ingestion. Why would that be a problem? Domestic bodies are okay. 
the foreign body is not so much. Right, uh, one that they might even not even be able to be taken up by the tube, right, depending on the size of the holes, but also, again, it could be an aspiration risk, right? Um, and then, as I mentioned, the toxin is bigger than the lavage tube hole. And again, I don't have an example to show you, but they're typically fairly small. You know, something like a digoxin or clonidine tablet can certainly fit through there, but if it's something like a big um, you know, potassium or anything like that, it's just not going to fit, okay? Uh, as I mentioned, complications are going to be aspiration being the biggest one, but then possible esophageal perforation, especially if you had any kind of like caustic exposure, um, you know, an acid or base or something like that, that would be a risk. Now, this one is done very frequently. So this is probably going to be the far and away the most uh, common thing you're going to run into, the most bang for your buck. And this is activated charcoal. Okay. Now, what's, how does activated charcoal work? So it'll kind of coat everything, but more importantly, what does it do? It's going to adsorb all of that medication, right, or whatever substance is going to be there. So it binds up a lot of stuff. It has a very, very high surface area. Basically, it's taking a bunch of charcoal briquettes, essentially, applying very high heat and pressure to it, and it makes it so it's a very, very high surface area, okay? That surface area is able to bind up those medications and allow it to pass, basically, right through the GI tract without any incident, without any further absorption there. Um, normally, we'll say you have to give it within the hour. Otherwise, unlikely to really... Uh, the charcoal is not going to be able to magically catch up to the to the drug there. Right? It's already past the stomach. It's not going to do a whole lot of good. So normally we'll say within the hour. If it's an opioid or anticholinergic, we'll give them a little bit longer time frame, usually two hours. Why is that? Yeah, both of those agents are going to slow down the GI tract anyway, so you're more likely to have drugs still sitting there in the stomach. So that's going to be uh, more effective. Okay. So those things to consider. Um, and again, you can see here. Anyone know what this tastes like? It's actually sweet. It actually, it tastes not bad. I've actually tried it before because um, they put sorbitol into it. So, again, it has a very kind of sweet texture to it. I not as a patient, right? It's just for experimental sex. Um, however, the, the texture of it is what oftentimes will kind of ick people out is the fact it's very, very gritty. And so some people don't like that. And so they have a hard time um, ingesting that very frequently, though. Um, if a patient is... Um, you're not willing to to drink it just again because it's dark black doesn't look good. Uh, sometimes we'll actually take a um, like a put it into a cup with a cover on it and then put like chocolate syrup down the straw. And sometimes that'll help like kids drink it. It makes it a little bit more amenable to them. So you know, little tricks we use. Anyway, uh, important things to know what it does not bind to, right? So again, if I had a test question, I said a patient presented with this sort of exposure, which one of these GID contamination modes would be most effective for it. Uh, there's going to be a list of things that charcoal just does not work for, right? So again, alcohols. Alcohols are very quick to get absorbed through the GI tract. You're going to find uh, it does not absorb by the charcoal. Not going to be good. So if I had someone who ingested a bunch of, say, rubbing alcohol or radiator fluid or something like that, and I'll make it very clear it's an alcohol if I were to ask that on the test, um, it would not bind. Heavy metals will not bind to it. So if you have a lithium ingestion, if you have an iron ingestion, potassium salt, and anything like that, any metal, it's not going to bind to charcoal. Hydrocarbons as well, also not going to bind to it, it's going to be no good, right? What are some contraindications? Obviously, any kind of aspiration risk is going to be a big one here because, again, charcoal in the lungs, not good. Um, any intestinal obstruction, usually not going to be a big issue, especially just for one dose, but it's something to consider. And then any kind of corrosive ingestions, mainly because we don't want the patient to throw up because that can, can for, cause further um, irritation of the GI tract. And then there's whole bowel irrigation. Now, again, there's nothing light about what's going to be happening here, but we use Golightly, that polyethylene glycol solution, in order to flush everything out of the GI tract. Now, based off what charcoal does not bind to, very frequently we'll use whole bout irrigation as an alternative to. So if you had, say, for instance, uh, a metal ingestion like lithium, we could use whole bout irrigation to basically flush it through the GI tract before it has a chance to absorb. Okay, so it's used occasionally. Um, it's good for those body uh, uh, heavy metals. It's good for body packers and stuffers. So if I had someone who you wanted to flush all that stuff through the GI tract without it being absorbed, that is one way to do it. Okay. Now, frequently what we do is a uh, tactic I like to call go darkly, where basically I will give charcoal first. That will bind up to anything that may be sitting there that is amenable to that, and then you follow it up by the polyethylene glycol, go lightly. And that way you can also use it as kind of a tracer. So when I'm checking the rectal effluent, if it comes out looking like charcoal, then I know, okay, at least that stuff is making its way through, okay? Uh, the goal, whenever giving whole bite irrigation, it's a lovely term, let's say the goal is clear rectal effluent. That means you flushed everything out of the GI tract. It's just go lightly coming out. That means that you've uh, basically tried to eliminate any further exposure. So that's good. Um, this is also good for sustained release products. So again, things that may be releasing over a long period of time, you can try to flush it out to try to eliminate any further exposure. And then also concretions. Anyone want to say when I say concretion, what that means? Basically, that stuff kind of 
sticking it together form like kind of a big ball of a substance. So we see this sometimes with aspirin, sometimes we'll see this with iron, uh, they form a concretion you can try to flush through uh, and prevent any further absorption there, right? And again, uh, if I had something like, say for instance, I had a, a child who ingested say a clonidine patch or say a fentanyl patch, this is also a good way to help um, decrease that exposure. That's a good one where I'd give charcoal, to help bind to the drug, anything that's leaching out, and then the go light would basically flush it right out. So that way you don't have any further exposure, right? Um, and again, think about the volume you're ingesting here. It starts off at 500 mLs an hour for an adult, up to two liters an hour. I think about drinking anything at two liters an hour, that's a lot of fluid, right? So again, what kind of side effects would you expect to see from that besides diarrhea? abdominal bloating, abdominal cramping. You think people are going to want to drink this? Very frequently, I have to do an NG tube and kind of give it to them without them actually drink it. I've only had one patient. I had one patient who had a lithium ingestion. Um, she was very um, uh, upset about the fact she had ingested all this lithium. She was very um, uh, agreeable to treatment. I said, okay, well, here, we're going to give this whole bowel irrigation. Um, can you drink two liters an hour? She said, I can do it. I said, are you sure? She said, yes. Sure enough, she did it. I don't know how she did it. But, and again, because what does it go lightly taste like? like room temperature sweat, like it not, does not taste good, right? Because it gets the electrolytes we put in there in order to make sure they don't have any electrolyte shifts uh, in the GI tract. So anyway, frequently that we'll give it to an NG tube in order to make sure uh, to get that through. Now again, the big risk is going to be aspiration. You don't want anyone to aspirate this stuff into the lungs. So again, if they have a depressed mental status where they're not with it enough to stay sitting upright on the bedside commode, this is not a good option for them, right? Um, and you have to make sure you're confirming placement of that NG tube if that's how you're giving it. Again, how could you check for placement? You know. Actually, if you uh, listen for, for bubbles, right? So you can actually blow air through it, and if you can hear bubbles uh, in the stomach, then you know you have good placement there. Um, anyway, so that is going to be uh, one of the big risks with that. If you accidentally put it in the lung and then infuse all that go lightly, it's not going to end well for your patient. Okay, so any questions on that? All right, I'm trying to think how many class sessions we have left. We have two more. I want to do a review. I'm going to try to get through acetaminophen real quick here. Um, I want to talk about acetaminophen uh, mainly because, uh, or, or why do you think I want to talk about it? Super common, right? Again, most of you probably have acetaminophen either uh, in your bag or at your house, or if you go to Costco, you can get a 55-gallon drum of it for like 10 bucks. It's everywhere, right? And so um, the other thing was, is if you notice, how often did this show up in any of the other toxidromes we talked about? It didn't at all, right? So this is one of those things where it's so ubiquitous, but it has no obvious toxidrome, especially early on, um, that I want to make sure you guys are at least familiar with it, to at least suspect it in the appropriate cases, so that way you can either rule it out or make sure you catch it so you can treat it effectively, right? Again, if someone comes in with an aspirin overdose, I can pretty well tell it's an aspirin overdose based off presenting with tachypnea, they're getting hyperthermic, they have a respiratory alkalosis, I can tell that, right? Someone with an aspirin or a Tylenol overdose, it's hard to tell unless you actually are specifically looking for it. So look at this, I want to show you... Um, the important thing to note here as well is that there's a lot of different pathways that we metabolize acetaminophen through in order to make sure it's not going to cause any sort of toxicity. And again, what's the big organ we're worried about here? The liver, right? So we want to prevent liver toxicity. Well, the liver has a lot of different ways to metabolize um, uh, acetaminophen that are non-toxic. However, we have an overdose. And again, what are some situations you might run into a Tylenol overdose? So you could have a suicide attempt, right? They're trying to harm themselves. They take a whole ton of it. What are the other more maybe insidious, insidious ways? People with chronic pain, right? People with fevers. People are just taking too much over a long period of time or people have concomitant hepatic disease. These are more common things. These are more kind of uh, slow onset things you may not notice uh, over a period of time. But let's say, take for instance, the people who have had an acute single ingestion, uh, an acute overdose here. Um, we have a lot of ways to metabolize that Tylenol that is non-toxic, but we overwhelm those pathways when you have uh, a single overdose like that. And so what happens is you're developing this metabolite. And this is the big one to think about here. It's called NAPQ, N-A-P-Q-I. And when that develops it, this is what causes all of those nasty hepatic effects, right? So this is what causes um, uh, free radicals to form. It causes protein degradation. It causes those hepatic cells to die off. And then eventually, it does, and one of the things, uh, kind of the misnomers about Tylenol, it doesn't only just affect the liver, Certainly, it's the first organ it affects, but later on, you can see that it can affect the heart, it can affect the kidneys, it can affect all sorts of things. And so, this is what we're trying to deal with. We're trying to get rid of this, okay? So, we're going to find that our antidote is going to be useful to try to restore a lot of those meta um, uh, metabolic pathways by giving the precursors to help us to start to reprocess it normally again. Okay, that's the main way we're going to be treating this. So, as you can see here, uh, glutathione is uh, how we're going to be abbreviating uh, GSH here. And so you can see once we get down to certain low enough levels, that's when we start to see NAPQI starting to form at higher levels. And that's when it leads to a lot of that toxicity. Okay. Um, now, normally a therapeutic 
dose of Tylenol is anywhere between 10 to 15 milligrams per kilogram. If you work in the hospital or anywhere or with pediatrics, you're going to be dosing this all the time. This is a typical dose you're going to be using, no problem, right? Um, once you start to get up to above 150 to 200 milligrams per kilo, especially in a single dose, that's where you're running the risk for that toxicity. It's going to deplete all those pathways and lead you to risk for toxicity. So again, an NAPQI form is going to cause cellular death, it's going to cause free radical formation, and it's going to cause further cellular damage. That's the thing we're really worried about. Again, hepatic is a big thing you all know about, but again, other organs can also take a hit as well. So other things that can predispose us to toxicity, if you're taking a lot of doses throughout the day, say you're taking it five, six times a day, say you're using prolonged excessive doses, maybe you're taking four and a half, five grams every single day. Um, if you have a chronic alcoholic, they're also going to have some concomitant hepatic disease on the fact they're probably ramping up some of the enzymes that help to um, make NAPQI, specifically 2E1 is a big one here, and then anyone that decreased glutathione uh, storage. So the reason why this is so dangerous is because for the first 24 hours or so, you actually don't have any real obvious signs and symptoms of Tylenol poisoning. You may have some GI upset, but other than that, you don't really manifest anything. Um, but again, this is one of those things that will kind of slowly be baking in the background, and once it makes itself known, there's not a lot you can do at that point in some cases, right? And so you're going to find uh, that uh, sometimes, though, you may find that you may be treating the patient for other concomitant ingestions. And so what's a common drug you find in combination with Tylenol? Diphenhydramine, right? So Tylenol PM is a common one. So you may be treating them for an anticholinergic poisoning. They have a concomitant Tylenol you have to worry about. What else? So the big one. The oxycodone, hydrocodone, right? The opioids. Super, super common combination. And very frequently, patients will present with an obvious opioid overdose. We see CNS, respiratory depressed, you have Narcan to wake up. But you may have this Tylenol toxicity you have to check for as well. Okay. So here's a key thing to note. Anytime you have any sort of intentional ingestion, either they're abusing it for self-harm or to get high or anything like that, you need to check a Tylenol level. Okay? Just do it. If you don't do it and you miss it, you're going to get in trouble, right? So always make sure you check that Tylenol level because it's so easy to miss if you don't check for it. Anyway, so the first 24 hours, you're not really seeing much, right? The NAPQI is forming, but it hasn't really made itself known yet. The next 24 to 36 hours is where you finally start to see the LFT start to rise. So very frequently, you have a patient presents that may have a Tylenol level of, say, 400, but their LFTs are totally normal, and that's an expected thing. You know that the LFTs are not going to rise until much later. Um, and then once that starts to develop, then you can start to see things like PTINR start to go up. And why would you expect that to occur? You're not making clotting factors at that point, right? So PTINR is going to be affected by that. And that's actually a, kind of a late sign, something I'm really worried about when I see that, because that shows me that the actual function of the liver is not doing what it's supposed to be doing anymore. Lactic acid is also going to start to go up. Bilirubin is going to start to go up. Patients may present jaundice if they're really late presenting. I had one patient um, who had probably one of the worst overdoses of Tylenol I'd ever seen. Um, he had uh, ingested an entire like 500 count bottle of uh, Tylenol. He said, okay, goodbye, cruel world. Took a nap. Woke up and said, I'm fine. Everything's great. It's awesome. But then he went to the library to check out what actually happens and saw that, oh, this actually isn't going to be a problem until, like, you know, another couple hours. By the time he presented, he was, I mean, mustard yellow from head to toe, right? This is the worst case of jaundice I'd ever seen. Um, fortunately, we were able to save him. We were able to get that uh, effect reversed. We'll talk about how in a second. But those are things you're going to be looking for. And this is late presenting, right? 24 to 36 hours afterwards. And eventually they go to the stage three. This is where things are getting really bad. This is where they are presenting jaundice. They are the transaminases maybe in the several thousands at this point. Uh, in fact, at some point, LT started to go back down. Why is that? Because they have no enzymes left, right? So again, that's another kind of bad portent is when you have the PTINR going up still, but the LFT is starting to go down. That's a really bad sign because that shows that you just got, have no enzymes left to, to release. Um, that's where they develop the renal failure, metabolic acidosis, et cetera. Okay? And again, death from hepatic failure can occur usually within three to five days or so. And this is not a very comfortable death. This is a very kind of slow, very kind of miserable sort of way to go out, right? So again, people think, oh, take Tylenol, end it all. It's not a very pretty thing to do, right? And then eventually, if they recover, they go into the stage four. You may find that it takes weeks to months for the LFTs to actually normalize out, but the PTINR will come back down to normal. LFTs will start to normalize out. And actually, we can send patients home. They may still have LFTs in the several hundreds, but we know they're recovering. They're heading in the right direction. We can send them home, right? Or oftentimes to a behavioral health, wherever they're going to go into. So, again, as I mentioned, assessing the risk, the history uh, is oftentimes unreliable. So they say, hey, I took this, when they really took something else. They lie about how much they took, or they lie about taking anything at all. That can be tough. So that's why we need acetaminophen levels. Get it every time. Anytime you have a suspicion, there might be an intentional ingestion going on. Or if you have someone who says, you know, the history, oh, I've been taking, you know, at this back pain, I'm taking Tylenol six, eight times a day. Those are people you want to check levels for, for as well. 
And then sometimes we'll do just based off the, the total amount ingested. So for instance, I have uh, adults, they've got more than seven and a half grams. I know they're at risk for it. Or if kids, they get more than 150 to 200 mg per kilo. And that's actually something we do calculation very frequently in the poison center because um, you guys seen like Tylenol liquid nowadays, like what kind of flavors and stuff that comes in. It's like orange flavored in a lot of cases, grape flavored. It's like good tasting, right? Back in the day when I was taking medicine, it was disgusting. And so I never want to take it. But nowadays kids will drink an entire bottle of Tylenol. No problem, right? And so parents will call up and say, oh my gosh, little Johnny drank this entire bottle. What do I do? And we can actually figure out based off the amount that was in the bottle to begin with, kind of worst case scenario, we say, okay, well, how much could he have gotten into if it was more than... 200 milligrams per kilo, we'll send them in to get levels done, et cetera. And, and so we, we do that pretty frequently. Um, oftentimes when parents say, oh my gosh, the kid drank the entire bottle. Usually what happens is they probably spilled a lot of it. It probably didn't taste that good, whatever they ingested. And parents are usually freaking out. So that's why a lot of, you know, kind of uh, you know, calm, calm down a little bit, try to get a better history. It can be, can be useful in situations there. So this is the Rumac Matthew nomograms. Anyone ever heard of this? Something you use pretty frequently, you probably find in your electronic medical record systems or whatever. But this tells you basically by plotting the tonal level onto this nomogram, you can determine whether or not you need to treat with the antidote, right? Based off the probabilities of them determining uh, of having hepatic toxicity. Okay, so this is named after Rumac and Matthews. Matthews is unfortunately dead, but Rumac still shows up at the tox conferences. And so if you ever want to see me nerd out, when I got to meet Dr. Rumac, it was amazing. I was just like, I was like meeting like, I don't know. Who's so famous nowadays? Like Johnny Depp or somebody. I was like, oh, you're so cool. He's like, okay, get away. Um, <laughs> always wears a bow tie. Very nice guy. Anyway, um, so what are the things to note here? What do you what do you notice about the time frame when this starts out? Four hours, right? You don't want to use any levels from anything before four hours. This is just what the studies have been validated on. The nice thing about Tylenol toxicity is, is if you get the antidote started within eight hours, virtually it's 100% effective. So because of that, we have a little bit of time with Tylenol in a lot of cases here. Now, again, how often is it you get a perfectly accurate history of time? Not very, right? So, again, oftentimes patients are found down for an unknown period of time. You may find um, that patients are unreliable in uh, determining how long ago the ingestion was. And so oftentimes we'll go off worst-based scenarios. But let's say we got a kid who got into something. Parents know when they got into it. We can use it. It's very useful. And so what you see here is if you have a level above 150 at four hours, then we know that we're going to go ahead and treat with the antidote. Okay, so that's basically our cutoff line is above 150 at four hours. And then basically you can kind of plot it out. So say they showed up to 12 hours after ingestion. Well, okay, if they have a level above, say, 37 and a half, then we go ahead and treat them for that, right? Or if they show up, say, 20 hours and have a level of, say, around 10 or so, then, yeah, we're still going to treat, right? Um, so again, just plot it on the nomogram. If it's above that level, then you go ahead and treat, okay? So again, I could ask a test question. I put the nomogram on there and I say, okay, here's the time frame, here's the level, do you treat or not treat? That wouldn't be a very good test question because there's only two answers in that case there, but you can see how I can uh, basically just say by plotting it out, you know exactly what you need to do. Okay, so anytime it's above the black line, this is our treatment line. Okay. So again, monitoring, we're looking at Tylenol levels, LFTs, PTINR, especially later presenting, and then basic metabolic panel can help us out with our acid base status. We'll know if we have an acidosis or not, it can be useful. Um, oftentimes, glucose can kind of go haywire in uh, more late presenting uh, Tylenol overdoses, mainly because where's a lot of our blood sugar managed? In the liver, right? So again, if we're not producing glucose, we don't have gluconeogenesis because the liver's going kaput, and that's why we may see hypoglycemia develop, et cetera. All right, so what do we do? Obviously, stabilize ABCs. Oftentimes, they may be seen as depressed from uh, opioid ingestion along with the Tylenol, so that. Um, and if they're within an hour, we'll give them activated charcoal. Okay, that will help to bind up the tunnel and maybe prevent ever need to treat in the first place. Uh, if they have hypoglycemia, you treat that. If they have coagulopathy, we can give them vitamin K or maybe blood products. But again, we need to make sure we're fixing the underlying problem, and that's where their antidote is going to be coming into play here. Some patients even go on to get transplant, although this is pretty rare, especially when you think about someone who intentionally tried to harm themselves. They oftentimes are not very high on that list. However, some patients do go on to get transplant in some cases there. You don't have to memorize this fact, but just know um, that these are things we're kind of looking at. They develop encephalopathy, serum creatinine's up, PT, et cetera. These are things we look at to determine whether they may be a candidate. So anyway, so what can we do? We're going to be applying precursors in order to get these metabolic pathways back in shape. And so we're going to be giving an uh, N-acetylcysteine, right? This is the main antidote we're going to be administering here. Basically, it's going to help to provide glutathione. It's going to donate those sulfhydryl groups. And again, that sulfur smells like what? Rotten eggs. So again, you always know uh, if you have uh, dealing with someone with N-acetylcysteine. As I mentioned, give it within eight hours, and it's 100% effective. 
very, very good from that standpoint. Um, but we'll still give it a long time. After that, we still find some more mortality benefits when, when uh, using it longer than that, basically because it helps to bind to free radicals, et cetera. So it's really nice from that standpoint. So um, we have an oral and an IV form. Most of the time nowadays, people are, or patients are going to get the IV form because if you had, if I gave you a big cup to drink and it smelled like rotten eggs, would you want to drink it? Probably not. A lot of patients throw up. So oftentimes we'll cut it with like citric, um, citrusy kind of drinks, like, you know, uh, some orange juice or something like that. And that will help cut down on some of that. Um, but most of the time patients end up getting IV anyway. Just know it's a little bit more costly, but they're both equally efficacious. Okay. Now, the reason why I mentioned the difference between these two is because there are different dosing strategies here. With the IV form, there's a 21-hour regimen, which again is on your assignment, I believe, to, to write that out. You'll see you're giving this dosing here. I'm not going to ask you specific dosing on the test. I just want you to know that, hey, you have this three-bag regimen for the IV form. And then versus the oral form, it's actually a 72-hour protocol that will be administering every four hours. And again, what you're going to find is if you get to the end of that time frame and the LFTs are still up and the PTINR is still up, am I going to stop the drug? Actually, I'll go ahead and continue it after that. So a lot of times we'll continue this drug even past this if the patient is still really, really sick. Okay. Um, and so that's a big thing. Just know N-acetylcysteine, no, you need to check that Rumac Matthew-nomogram. Four hours is a time frame to start plotting that. Get the antidote early. That kind of stuff, okay? Always get a tunnel level if you have any kind of suspicions. Anytime you have an intentional ingestion, you always want to check the tunnel level. Now, could a patient present with tunnel, uh, a tunnel level of zero and still be toxic? Yes, this is something a lot of a lot of providers don't know, and I have to actually uh, educate them on this. Is that if a patient presents late, they may have metabolized all that Tylenol, but again, what am I really worried about? That NAPQI. So they may have levels of that which we can't check for, and so they may be in that period where the Tylenol levels are zero, but the LFTs are not starting to rise yet because it's maybe within that 24-hour period, and they can still be at risk. Okay, so again, sometimes we based off history. Sometimes we'll say let's monitor for them uh, and see what happens in the next 12, 24 hours. There's a lot of uh, <laughs> A lot of shades of gray there, but just know the room at Matthew Nomogram is the way we normally will uh, do that for acute ingestions. Okay. Any questions on that? Let me check the board, see if there's anything that came up here. Nothing at all. You guys are geniuses. You know everything already. Fantastic. Uh, if not, I will see you guys next time.